Good evening. On behalf of the Economics Graduate Student Union, the Peace Studies Program, and the Department of Sociology, I welcome you to the American University. I would like to mention beforehand, before we get started here, that we are um, have a few of Noam Chomsky's books on sale in the back, in the back lobby. So if you like, after the talk, you can go back there, ten dollars a piece. It's a bargain. Noam Chomsky is well known and is usually introduced as the world's best-known linguist, as a noted critic of U.S. foreign policy, and as the author of dozens of books whose subject matter range from Cartesian linguistics and semantics and generative grammar to U.S. foreign policy and terrorism, Central America and the Middle East. He should also be introduced as a regular columnist for Zeta magazine, as a prolific letter writer spinning out an average of 15,000 words a week in correspondence, and as a speaker who is usually scheduled two years in advance. He is a tireless advocate of dissident movements and projects around the world, lending his time in seemingly, seemingly beyond human capability and without the slightest expectation of reciprocation. He is the most frequently misquoted, misinterpreted, censured, and censored writer by intellectuals and elite opinion makers in the East as well as in the West. Dr. Chomsky is also a summertime gardener and a sailor who likes nothing more than to sail out Wellfleet Harbor for a few hours of relaxation on Cape Cod. In the final analysis, it appears that there is only one good way to introduce this extraordinary person. May I present to you Noam Chomsky. get nervous when I talk in Washington because I have this sneaking suspicion that everything's penetrated by the CIA. And with all the information that Carla just had, I really uh, am beginning to believe it. <laughs> How'd you find out 15,000 words a week? <laughs> uh, well, the title of this talk, as I suppose you saw somewhere, is Necessary Illusions, Thought, Control, and Democratic Societies. Can't hear me? Oh, okay. I, all I did so far is say something irrelevant and announce the topic. <laughs> uh, the, how's that? Better? The title is uh, intended to be paradoxical. It should be. Uh, thought control and indoctrination are inconsistent with democracy. Therefore, one can't have thought control in a democratic society. Uh, the, uh, uh, there is a standard view about this matter. The standard view is expressed, for example, by Supreme Court Justice Powell, uh, who speaks of what he calls the societal purpose of the First Amendment, that is, enabling the public to assert meaningful control over the political process. Now, he happens to be speaking about the media and their crucial role in affecting this societal purpose. And similar remarks could be made and should be made about the educational system, about publishing, uh, about intellectual life generally. But the media are particularly important in providing free access to information and opinion and therefore allowing a democratic process to function in a meaningful way. So the media therefore fulfill what uh, the New York Times on Sunday called their traditional Jeffersonian role as a counterbalance to government power. And if one takes Jefferson seriously, as he may or may not have taken himself, uh, he would presumably have gone further, speaking not just of counterbalancing government power, but counterbalancing other concentrations of power, specifically the kinds that developed in the post-Jeffersonian period, uh, corporate power, which is the dominant feature of modern social life. Well, all of this seems obvious, even tautological. What else could be the foundations of democracy? Uh, but it's worth bearing in mind that there is a contrary view, and it probably is the dominant view among uh, liberal democratic theorists. It goes right back to the origins of modern democracy in the English revolutions of the 17th century, English revolution of the 17th century. At that time, great concern was expressed over popular agitators, uh, itinerant 
preachers and workers uh, with their little printing presses and their pamphlets and their public speeches, which were removing the cloak of mystery behind which the parliament and the king were carrying out their much narrower struggle, the one you read about in history books. Uh, now, uh, these people were, uh, 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 in their words, they were people who wanted to be represented not by lords and gentry, but by men of their own kind, men who know the people's swords, quoting from leveler pamphlets. And observing their activities, uh, one contemporary historian warned that by revealing the workings of power, they will make the people so curious and so arrogant that they will never find humility enough to submit to a civil rule, which is a big problem. Well, well after these radical, radical Democrats had been crushed by about 1660, uh, John Locke wrote that day laborers and tradesmen, spinsters and dairy maids, must be told what to believe. The greatest part cannot know, and therefore they must believe. Now, uh, these concerns arose once again during the American Revolution, uh, as they typically do during popular revolutions. Uh, and uh, uh, it was not until the 1780s that the radical Democrats in the American Revolution were crushed and uh, there was no more any thought that people would be represented by people at that time, men of their own kind who know the people's sores. Uh, they would be represented by uh, those qualified to rule over them of whom they were permitted to make a selection, the modern democratic political system, uh, which follows the principle laid down by the founding fathers that those who own the country ought to govern it, uh, quoting John Jay. Uh, now, uh, um, all of this comes right to the present. I won't try to go through the history, but there's a rich tradition expressing these same views. It comes right down to the present. Uh, in the modern version, uh, Reinhold Niebuhr, for example, the revered moralist and uh, foreign policy analyst, uh, he explained that, in his words, rationality belongs to the cool observer. Uh, but because of the stupidity of the average man, he follows not reason, but faith. And this faith relies upon necessary illusion. I thank him for offering me my title. This faith relies upon necessary illusion and emotionally potent oversimplifications, which have to be provided by the myth makers, by the cool observers, folks like us, smart guys who know how to serve power. Uh, Walter Lippmann, Dean of American Journalists, a few years earlier, talked about what he called the manufacture of consent, which he said has become a self-conscious art and a regular organ of popular government in a revolution in the practice of democracy. And that's appropriate because the common interests very largely elude public opinion entirely and can be managed only by a specialized class, Niebuhr's cool observers. Uh, the same concerns explain a good deal of the fear of radical movements abroad right up to the present. So for example, in the early 19th century, the Tsar of Russia was deeply concerned about the contagion of revolutionary ideas coming from American democracy, which might undermine the conservative world order that he and Metternich and others were presiding over. And a century later, the roles were reversed, but the same ideas were expressed. Uh, at the time when Woodrow Wilson sent troops to join the Western intervention against the Bolsheviks, uh, his Secretary of State, echoing the Tsar a century earlier, warned that the Bolsheviks were appealing, I'm quoting Robert Lansing, were quoting to the were appealing to the proletariat of all countries, to the ignorant and mentally deficient, who by their very numbers are urged to become masters. Uh, now that intervention, the Western and US intervention in Russia, is often described as defensive by contemporary diplomatic historians, John Lewis Gaddis to mention a recent case. And there's a sense in which they're right. There's a sense in which the intervention was defensive, and it's expressed by these views. It was in defense uh, of privilege against the ignorant masses at home who might have gotten the wrong ideas from these radical developments abroad. 
and not surprisingly, the defensive intervention, uh, uh, which involved sending troops to the Soviet Union in defense against the ignorant masses at home, coincided with a harsh repression at home to undermine uh, labor, freedom of speech, uh, independent politics, uh, Wilson's, Woodrow Wilson's Red Scare, which was very strongly supported by the media uh, through the most tyrannical phase. Uh, in short, the function of the herd is to do their work in silence and not to interfere in serious matters. Now, there's also what's sometimes called the political class, the minority of people who are articulate and educated and can get involved in political affairs. Uh, and that minority also is in need of necessary illusions, maybe even more so than the ignorant and stupid masses. Uh, the point is to ensure that they can do their work of political and ideological management with a proper appreciation of the prerogatives of privilege and power. That's what the educational system is about, and that's what the elite media are about. Well, um, these uh, remarks that I was quoting from Lippmann and uh, Niebuhr and others were from the 20s and the early 30s. Lippmann's were right after the First World War, and the timing is important. During the First World War, John Dewey's circle of liberal intellectuals became very much impressed with, they, with what they saw as their success in having, I'm quoting from the New Republic, one of my favorite journals, uh, 1917, having imposed their will upon a reluctant or indifferent majority, uh, they used propaganda fabrications about Hun atrocities and jingoistic oversimplifications, which they relayed, many of them created for them by the British propaganda services. Uh, they became engaged in what was called at the time historical engineering, that was a phrase used by Frederick Paxson, who was the founder of something called the National Board for Historical Service, uh, an organization of American historians. And historical engineering, uh, he defined as the task of serving the state by explaining the reasons of the war that we might better win it, called agitprop in the Communist Party. Uh, the, in order to ensure that the uh, reluctant and indifferent majority who, as usual, are pacifistic. The stupid and ignorant masses usually don't see much point in going out and killing people and getting killed. You have to whip them into uh, excitement and so on. Uh, in order to ensure that they would, the, the, the uh, reluctant and indifferent majority that the Deweyites were worried about would support the war, the uh, government uh, created the first uh, propaganda agency, I think, the first propaganda agency in American history called the Creel Commission, Commission on Public Information, uh, which was designed to uh, ensure that people thought the right ideas, that they had the necessary illusions. Uh, that's actually a predecessor of a much more elaborate program uh, created by the Reagan administration, uh, the Office of Public Diplomacy. That was an illegal operation, uh, declared illegal by a later congressional review, though nobody cares, naturally. Uh, the, uh, uh, an illegal operation designed to intimidate critics uh, to uh, carry out what the administration called demonizing the Sandinistas and crucially gaining support for the U.S. terror states in Central America, which had to somehow be converted into work. Are we hard to hear? Sorry. How's that? Well, I'll try to remember to stay close to this thing. Their task was to demonize the Sandinistas and to uh, create support to turn the terror states that the United States is creating and supporting into what are called democracy. Uh, this, uh, this operation was exposed by one of the very few journalists who actually seriously reported the Iran-Contra hearings, Alfonso Charty of the Miami Herald, later other work. Uh, when Charty exposed it, he uh, went to Reagan administration officials and asked them to comment on it, and one of them uh, described the operation as a spectacular success. Uh, he described it as the kind of operation that you carry out in enemy territory. And that's, that's the right term. Uh, it expresses the way in which contemporary so-called conservatism regards the population. Uh, it's enemy territory that has to be subdued. And if you can't do it by force, you do it by propaganda. And as is, should be 
clear from these comments, that's a tradition that goes way back to the origins of modern democracy. Uh, the same ideas appear explicitly in the public relations industry. The patron saint of the modern public relations industry, uh, Edward Bernays, received his training in the Creel Commission, which he was a member of, uh, and he later developed the concept of what he called engineering of consent, which he said is the essence of democracy and is something which he practiced, uh, for example, in demonizing the democratic capitalist government of Guatemala uh, when he was working for the United Fruit Company in 19, early 50s, uh, paving the way for the CIA coup, which has turned the place into a charnel house. Uh, and the public relations industry from the very beginnings, from the early part of the century, uh, described its task as controlling the public mind, uh, educating the American people about the economic facts of life to ensure a favorable climate for business, and a proper understanding of what Lippmann called the common interests. The public mind is the only serious danger confronting the company, uh, an AT&T executive uh, commented about 80 years ago, uh, and those problems have been addressed ever since. That's the role of the PR industry. There's also an academic twist to all of this. In fact, it's a major theme in the academic social sciences. Uh, one of the uh, leading American political scientists, uh, the sort of major figure in the field of communications, Harold Laswell, uh, wrote uh, uh, an interesting commentary on this in 1933 in the uh, International Encyclopedia of Social Sciences, the entry under propaganda. Those were more honest days. People called things what they were. Uh, he wrote an entry under propaganda in which he explained that we must not succumb to democratic dogmatisms about men being the best judges of their own interests. They are not. The best judges are the elites who must be ensured the means to impose their will for the common good. And the means, he said, are a whole new technique of control, largely through propaganda. And it's necessary to do this because of the ignorance and superstition of the masses. Uh, and then he explained why it's particularly important in a democracy. It's not the case, as the naive might think, that indoctrination is inconsistent with democracy. Rather, as this whole line of thinkers observes, it's the essence of democracy. The point is that in a military state or a feudal state or what we would nowadays call a totalitarian state, it doesn't much matter what people think because you've got a bludgeon over their head and you can control what they do. So you can be a behaviorist. I don't care if they think at all. Uh, you can control what they do. But when the state loses the bludgeon, when you can't control people by force, and when the voice of the people can be heard, you have this problem. Uh, it may make people so curious and so arrogant that they don't have the humility to submit to a civil rule, and therefore you have to control what people think, uh, to, in, for their own good, of course, uh, to ensure that uh, they don't get out of control. Now, there's another variant of this. It's the mainstream of Bolshevism. And in fact, the two positions are very close, and I think that's one of the reasons why you have this constant phenomenon of people shifting quickly and instantaneously from one position to the other, because they're really not changing their positions, they're just changing their assessment of where power is. So it's a very easy shift to make. It's the famous God that failed transition. Uh, this goes right on to current periods. In the early post-Second World War period, uh, take one example, presidential historian Thomas Bailey wrote that because the masses are notoriously short-sighted and generally cannot see danger until it is at their throats, our statesmen are forced to deceive them into an awareness of their own long-run interests. Deception of the people may in fact become increasingly necessary unless we are willing to give our leaders in Washington a freer hand. And our leaders in Washington had the same thoughts about other people in Washington who didn't understand. Uh, for example, Dean Acheson thought that it was going to be necessary to bludgeon the mind of top government uh, into uh, appropriate fear of the communist threat by being, as he put it, clearer than truth. Uh, and uh, uh, this goes going up to the present, and or close to the present, in 1981, as a new crusade was being launched, Samuel Huntington, a professor of government at Harvard University, and a long-time government advisor, 
explained that you have to sell, you may have to sell intervention or other military action in such a way as to create the misimpression that it's the Soviet Union that you're fighting. That's what the United States has been doing ever since the Truman Doctrine, which is quite accurate. The Truman Doctrine was, uh, the, in effect, it was the announcement of a major and murderous counterinsurgency operation in Greece, and it was necessary to create the misimpression that it was the Soviet Union we're fighting. Uh, that's the way you bludgeon people into accepting it, and that goes right up to the present. Uh, he's thinking about the American wars in Central America. And that gives you an accurate insight into the nature of the Cold War, incidentally, uh, one of the rare, honest insights. Well, uh, the, these concerns over the controlling the public mind became quite serious in the 1970s uh, because of all the turmoil of the 60s. What happened in the 60s is that once again, as periodically since the 17th century, you had all these agitators and itinerants and little printing presses and so on who were making the people uh, arrogant and getting them to lose their humility and so on, and something had to be done about that. Now the name for that at the time in the 70s was called the Crisis of Democracy. Uh, that's the title of an important study done by the Trilateral Commission in 1975, and bear in mind that's international liberalism. Those are the circles around Jimmy Carter uh, from Europe, Japan, and the United States. And they were concerned, it's a very important book, I think. Uh, they describe, it's very similar to the same concerns that have been expressed since the 17th century. The terms are a little bigger, the words are a little longer, and so on, but it's basically the same thing. Uh, there was a crisis of democracy that erupted in the 60s, and the crisis of democracy was that the stupid and ignorant masses began to become involved in trying to shape their own affairs. So you had the beginnings of organization of all sorts of people who wanted to be represented by now people of their own kind, even worse than men of their own kind, who know the people sores. Uh, you had organization of uh, youth and women and uh, ethnic minorities and all these people are supposed to be quiet, they're just supposed to do their job. And that the naive might call that democracy, but the smart guys understand that that's a crisis of democracy that has to be overcome. And the way you have to overcome it is by restoring the people to apathy and obedience so they don't get in the way. And of course you're doing it for their own good, remember, because they are so stupid and ignorant uh, that they're just going to get in trouble. It's like letting a three-year-old run across the street. It wouldn't be decent to do that. Uh, and that's what the crisis of democracy is about. Well, summarizing briefly, there's two views of the topic of indoctrination and democracy. One view is the standard one. It's the one I quoted from Justice Powell, and that's at the rhetorical level, that's the one that everybody's supposed to hold. Uh, the people should assert meaningful control over the political process, and for that they have to have free access to information and so on. Then there's another view, which in fact is probably the standard view, and that is that the people are a dangerous enemy, and they have to be controlled for their own good, and for that, you need necessary illusions and emotionally potent oversimplifications and manufacture of consent and the rest of the stuff that uh, the specialized class or their representatives have to carry out. Well, with regard to the media, there's also a standard view, and it's, again, the one that Justice Powell expressed. Uh, they are supposed to fulfill the traditional Jeffersonian role of being a counterweight to concentrated power. Uh, and the standard view is that that's what they do. Now, there is a debate over the media, but the debate is over whether they go too far in performing this necessary service. Do they go so far in their, adver in, in their adversarial, confrontational attitude towards power that they're going beyond responsible limits? Maybe they're going so far in attacking power and attacking uh, existing institutions that they're actually undermining the functioning of democracy. And there is a big, vigorous debate over that. Uh, the Trilateral Commission report, for example, felt that that was true and felt that unless the media can become more responsible and stop being so confrontational, um, they'll have to be curbed. If they can't curb themselves, they'll have to be curbed by legislation. And the same message is implicit in a Freedom House study uh, of the media at the same time. They claim that the media lost the war by being so uh, confrontational and hating power so much and so on. Uh, and in, as I say, there's a very lively debate over that issue. The debate is between the people who say, yeah, the media are too confrontational, they're too adversarial, 
And then there are the others who say, just to quote another, uh, Justice Gerfine this time, we have a cantankerous press, an obstinate press, a ubiquitous press, but it must be suffered by those in authority in order to preserve the even greater values of freedom of expression and the right of the people to know, fulfilling the traditional Jeffersonian role. Well, that's the debate, and it's a lively one. Now, outside of the spectrum of debate, there happens to be another position. The other position uh, challenges the factual assumption that's taken for granted in the debate. According to this alternative view, the media don't fulfill any sort of traditional Jeffersonian role. They fulfill a society, societal purpose, all right, but it's quite a different one. Their societal purpose is the one that is advocated by elites, namely to inculcate and to defend the economic and social and political agenda of the privileged groups that dominate the domestic society. Uh, they want to ensure that those who own the country will be able to govern it, uh, to refer back to the founding principle of the founding fathers. And they do this in all sorts of ways, by selection of topics, by distribution of concerns, by emphasis and framing of issues, by filtering of information, by outright lying sometimes, uh, by bounding of debate within certain limits. There may incidentally be a liberal bias to some extent, as is constantly claimed. Uh, in fact, if the system functions well, it ought to have a liberal bias, or at least appear to, because if it appears to have a liberal bias, that will serve to bound thought even more effectively. In other words, if the press is indeed adversarial and liberal and all these bad things, then how can I go beyond it? They're already so extreme in their opposition to power that to go beyond it would be to take off from the planet. So therefore, it must be that the presuppositions that are accepted in the liberal media are sacrosanct, can't go beyond them. Uh, and a well-functioning system would, in fact, have a bias of that kind. The media would then serve to say, in effect, thus far and no further. And the presuppositions that are accepted and never even discussed are then the foundation of, of uh, thinkable thought within the limits of that are defined by those presuppositions. You can have plenty of debate, but you can't transcend it. So to take one issue that was discussed and debated over decades, take, say, the uh, U.S. wars in Indochina. There certainly was a debate, certainly by the late 60s. Uh, the debate was between the hawks and the doves. Uh, the, hawks were just, the hawks were people like, say, Joseph Alsop, right-wing journalist, hawkish journalist, uh, who said that if we keep at, at it, with enough intensity and vigor and violence and all those good things, uh, we'll be able to win the war in, we'll be able to defend South Vietnam successfully. And then there were the doves, like for example, Arthur Schlesinger, uh, who wrote that uh, we all pray that Mr. Alsop will be right, uh, and if he is, we'll all be praising the wisdom and statesmanship of the American government in reducing Vietnam to a land of ruin and wreck, as he described what was happening. Uh, but since he's a dove, he doesn't think he's right. So the task of defending South Vietnam is obviously a noble cause. Defending a country is always noble. Uh, but we probably can't get away with it, or it'll be too bloody, or something like that. That makes you a dove. Now there, again, is another position. The other position is that we're not defending South Vietnam at all. We're attacking South Vietnam. And we certainly attacked it ever since John F. Kennedy sent the American Air Force to start bombing it in 1962, if not before. And after that, we just attacked it outright. Uh, that uh, point of view, which is outside the debate, notice, it's neither a hawk nor a dove position, happens to be the view that was held by the majority of the American public, but it's outside the debate. Uh, and it has one thing for it, namely it's plainly true, but it has one thing against it, namely it's plainly true. Uh, therefore, it's inexpressible, and it's outside the framework of debate. And it was outside the framework of debate. You have to look very hard. To, in fact, I've never succeeded uh, since John F. Kennedy sent the American Air Force to bomb South Vietnam. I've been looking for this. I've never found a phrase in the media, or for that matter, an academic scholarship, suggesting that the United States was attacking South Vietnam, except in you know, unspeakable literature of the kind that I write and so on. But uh, uh, in anything minimally respectable, you know, that doesn't offend people, uh, uh, I can't find that phrase ever mentioned. 
It's kind of interesting if you think about it. I mean, for example, the Soviet press, which is plainly controlled, it's party press, was capable of seeing that the Soviet Union was invading Afghanistan, uh, not just defending it. Uh, and uh, that's worth pondering. But the point is that the liberal bias plays a role uh, in defining the Dove position. We're defending South Vietnam and maybe it's unwise. That's the limits of thought. And the same is true on just about every topic. Notice that the assumption that the press is adversarial and confrontational is a highly functional assumption. It plays a role in instilling necessary illusions, namely the ones that the allegedly confrontational press adheres to. Correspondingly, it follows that no challenge to this should be permitted. Now, there, this alternative view that I've described, that a view that my co-author Edward Herman and I call a propaganda model of the media, which just challenges the assumption, is therefore dysfunctional. And the propaganda model itself predicts that it cannot become part of the debate. Uh, the reason is it's dysfunctional, and dysfunctional things are not allowed into a propaganda system. So therefore, the debate will rage, you can predict, between those who say the media are too, uh, conf you know, too confrontational and those who say, well, we have to tolerate them because what can we do? Uh, that prediction of the, con of the propaganda model incidentally is very well confirmed. Uh, there's a lot of debate about the media, but you won't find this option uh, discussed within it. Can't be, un can't be con conceived of. And that's a kind of an interesting fact if you think about it for at least three reasons. Uh, one reason is that the propaganda model happens to be advocated by elites and has been advocated by elites for years. In other words, the normative position that this is the way the media ought to operate is a very standard position. So therefore, you'd think that the descriptive comment that they do operate this way would at least be part of the discussion. Uh, a second reason is, quite apart from elite advocacy, that the propaganda model has a lot of prior plausibility on quite uncontroversial assumptions. Just take uncontroversial institutional assumptions. Let's say we have basically a free market, maybe marginally guided. So a guided free market, that's not controversial. And what would you expect the media to do? Well, just look at what they are. Uh, the media are differentiated. There's national. assumptions, you'd expect the propaganda model, you'd expect the media to behave the way elites advocate that they ought to behave, namely in terms of the propaganda model. A third point is that the, the general public, by and large, thinks that that's the way the media do operate. So polls show that the public, to the extent that has opinions on this matter, regards the media as too conformist, too much submissive to power. Well, that's three observations. Uh, the model has prior plausibility, elite advocacy, it's accepted by the general public. That doesn't prove that it's valid, but it does suggest that it might be part of the discussion at least. It isn't, and that's a prediction of the propaganda model, uh, which is supported. Well, let's turn to the quest, finally to the question, is it valid? Well, for that you have to do empirical work. You have to look and see whether the propaganda model is valid. Uh, and in fact, by now, uh, there are literally thousands of pages of detailed documentation in print and more coming out, uh, which analyzes the propaganda model in every imaginable way. It's been subjected to the harshest tests anybody can think of, uh, and there's lots of different ways of approaching it that have been studied. 
It's been studied in all sorts of cases. I mean, let the opposition pick the ground. We'll show that those cases supported anything you like. Uh, I think it's one of the best verified theses in the social sciences, to tell you the truth. I concede that that's not saying a lot, but uh, <laughs> it's uh, at least got that status. Uh, but in accord with its predictions, it's off the agenda. And in fact, you can predict pretty confidently that even if it was established to the level of physics, it would still be off the agenda. In fact, that would just make it worse. Uh, it, there's something going on here which has kind of a logic of uh, the tradition of the legal tradition of seditious libel. You know, it, it's long been a doctrine that you can assault the state by speech, uh, criminal assault against the state by speech seditious libel, and through the whole tradition of seditious libel, still very recent, I should say, uh, that uh, uh, the truth was never a defense. It was never possible to plead truth in defense for a very obvious reason. If your charges against the state are true, then the crime of bringing authority into disrespect is even greater. Uh, so therefore, truth can't be a defense. And the same is true of the propaganda model. If it's true, it's even worse because then it's making the people so arrogant that, that they're going to lose the humility to submit to civil rule, so it's even worse. Well, that's a safe prediction, I think. Uh, let's take a look at a couple of cases, and that's the way I'll... I mean, I, I almost hate to discuss cases because it's misleading, since you might argue plausibly I'm selecting the ones that work. You really have to see the spectrum of examples that have been studied, I think, to become convince yourselves of this, and I hope you will. But let's just take a few illustrations. Well, one issue that plainly ought to interest the media is freedom of the press. And in fact, there's a lot of discussion of freedom of the press in the media. And it's kind of interesting to see the way it works. So let's look at the way it works. Notice what the propaganda model would predict. The propaganda model would predict there's no interest whatsoever in freedom of the press. There's an interest in serving power. So we'll be interested in freedom of the press when it serves the interests of domestic power and privilege, but not elsewhere. That's the prediction of the propaganda model. Well, let's take a look at the facts. Uh, let's just take the last decade. Uh, in the last decade, there's been a tremendous amount of discussion of freedom of the press in the, in the press. Uh, for in the, uh, and and the, the issue that has dominated the discussion, probably more discussion than all discussion of freedom of the press elsewhere in the world combined, is the harassment of La Prensa in Nicaragua. Ask people to name one newspaper outside the United States, and that's probably the one they'll name. And there's a good reason for that. It just has an enormous media coverage. Uh, one study found uh, over a four-year period that in the New York Times, there was more than, stories were running more than one a week on, on the tribulations of La Prensa. And I don't doubt for a moment that that's more than on all other cases of freedom of the press combined. You might try that. Uh, now, uh, uh, th there's some interesting uh, uh, this, this sometimes reached a peak. For example, in one, one peak was reached in June 1986. Summer of 1986 was an interesting period. Uh, in June of 1986, uh, Nicaragua uh, announced that it would support the Contadora Treaty, the draft of the Contadora Treaty. Uh, the U.S. client states announced that they were not going to sign, that they were going to reject it. Uh, all of that was suppressed in the press. The rejection of it by the client states, I don't think it's reported at all. The Washington Post did not report the Nicaraguan willingness to accept it. Uh, the New York Times had a couple of words about it in the round the world news, you know, marginal affairs under the framework of the uh, Reagan administration denounces propaganda move by Nicaragua or something. Uh, uh, kind of, that's kind of interesting in itself because up until June, the refusal of Nicaragua to sign the Contadora Treaty had been a big story, major stories in the press about the treacherous Sandinistas who refused to sign the treaty, uh, and that's blocking peace. Uh, by uh, June, that discussion was over, and the issue was off the agenda for the reasons I've just mentioned. Uh, so Nicaragua announced it would sign the Contadora Treaty. U.S. client states rejected it, obviously, under U.S. pressure. Uh, right at that point, the World Court came out with its, its decision uh, condemning the United States for what it called the unlawful use of force and the violation of treaties and calling upon the United States to terminate these crimes and to pay reparations. That was the end of June. Uh, just at that time, Congress responded to the World Court decision by voting $100 million in aid to the Contras to continue the unlawful use of force. Uh, 
The press, incidentally, dismissed the World Court ruling as irrelevant. Uh, the New York Times called the World Court a hostile forum, which we don't have to pay any attention to. Uh, the assumption is that the United States is a lawless and violent state, and therefore if some international tribunal says that we're violating the law, it's irrelevant. We continue. Congress responded to the uh, decision by voting $100 million in aid. Uh, the Reagan administration was delighted. The Reagan administration officials announced, said that this amounts to a declaration of war against Nicaragua. Nicaragua responded to this by suspending La Prensa. Well, that caused furor in the United States. The uh, journalism fellows of Harvard, the Neiman fellows, uh, at once offered the owner of La Prensa a, a big prize. The Washington Post had editorials with titles like Newspaper of Valor, uh, saying that Violeta Chamorro deserves 10 awards. I mean, great furor over freedom of the press by all the outraged libertarians. Uh, and that was a peak, but throughout the whole period, plenty of talk about the problems of La Prensa. Well, let's take a look at that. First of all, what is La Prensa? Uh, that's an interesting question. La Prensa is always described as the newspaper that courageously opposed uh, Somoza. But that is not true, or it's true, let's say, only under a very curious interpretation of the facts. Uh, what happened is that in 1980, after the Sandinista Revolution, the owners of La Prensa, they were already getting a CIA subsidy, uh, decided to turn the newspaper into an anti-government journal, meaning a US government journal. At that point, the editor of the journal and 80% of the staff left and founded a new newspaper because they didn't like this new line. The new newspaper is El Nuevo Diario, and that's the old La Prensa, if a newspaper is defined by its editor and its staff. Now, of course, if a newspaper is defined by the money behind it and the printing presses, then, of course, the new La Prensa is the old La Prensa. But that's a value judgment. Depends what you think an a journal is. Is it the editor and the staff, or is it the money behind it? Well, if it's the editor and the staff, then this La Prensa has nothing to do with that La Prensa. Uh, the new La Prensa, uh, supports the overthrow of the government, the violent overthrow of the government by a foreign power, uh, and it happens to be funded by that foreign power. Uh, now, as far as I know, that's a unique phenomenon in history. I don't know of any remotely parallel case in the history of the Western democracies. You might look for one. Uh, uh, I should say that none of this is ever mentioned in the, all this fury over uh, La Prensa. But let's say that it's, even though it apparently is a totally unique phenomenon, something that the Western democracies would never have tolerated for a moment. I mean, we had much harsher censorship of, I mean, of, of the press in, when we were under no threat at all in the First and Second World War as in Britain and so on. The idea that the British, say, in 1942, would have allowed their, a major newspaper funded by the Nazis uh, and calling for the overthrow of the government, I mean, it's so outlandish, we don't have to bother discussing it, but nevertheless, uh, true libertarians, true civil libertarians, will defend uh, La Prensa from repression, despite the fact that this is totally unique. That is, a true civil libertarian will say that Nicaragua ought to forge new standards far beyond what the United States or England or these other depraved powers would ever consider. Uh, so the question arises, is the furor over La Prensa cr uh, created because American intellectuals have suddenly developed uh, libertarian passions that they never had in the past, or, or is it that they're trying to serve the interests of power? Uh, well, that's a question that can be put to the test, notice. We know exactly how to put it to the test, incidentally. We can ask the same question about, say, the con our enemies, and there we can, we can think. So let's take a look at what we do. Take, say, the World Peace Council, the Communist Front Organization, or the East German you know, Human Rights Group or something. If you read its materials, you discover that it often has very valid critique of crimes and atrocities in the United States and the US client states. In fact, often things that aren't reported much here. And by and large, it tends to be true. And they're very passionate about it because of their civil libertarian sentiments, which are outraged. Well, we have a way of testing whether they mean it or not. Uh, we ask, what do they say about the Soviet Union and its client states? And as soon as we get the answer to that, we dismiss the whole business with total contempt uh, quite rightly, even if it happens to be true. So if we have the honesty to apply that same test to ourselves, we can proceed to do it. So let's do it. Uh, and it's straightforward. We can begin right nearby. So let's take El Salvador and Guatemala right next door. Uh, 
Uh, El Salvador once had an independent press uh, before the Carter administration and then the Reagan administration launched the war to defend democracy in El Salvador, as it's called. They had an independent press. Uh, there was no censorship, because uh, we don't like censorship. Uh, the independent press was eliminated, however. Uh, there were two newspapers, two small newspapers. Neither of them was funded by a foreign power. Neither was calling for the overthrow of the government. In fact, the most they were doing was calling for a mild land reform or opposing corruption or something. One of the newspapers was eliminated by the simple device of uh, the security forces that we fund and train and run. Uh, got, took the editor out of it and a, a photojournalist out of a San Salvador restaurant, took him outside, cut him to pieces with machetes and left him in a ditch. That took care of one newspaper. The owner fled to Los Angeles. The second newspaper, after several assassination attempts and uh, the murder of a newsboy and so on, was finally surrounded by army tanks uh, who then entered the prem and smashed up the premises and destroyed them, at which point the editor of that news, the owner of that newspaper, fled to the United States. Since then, there's been no independent press in uh, El Salvador, but notice this was done without censorship, real civil libertarian standards. Uh, so we ask, uh, now, the next, now we ask the kind of question we ask about the Communist Party. Uh, what was the reaction in the United States to this? Well, the answer to that is pretty simple. The answer, the reaction was zero. Uh, FAIR, the media monitoring organization, recently did a survey of the New York Times since the two uh, newspapers were destroyed. Up until the time they were destroyed, there were a couple of small stories, meaning that they knew what was going on. The stories were about bombing attacks against the newspapers by the security forces and death threats and so on. Once they were, dis the destruction was not reported. And there has been not one word referring to that in the New York Times since, in the news columns. There has been not one word referring to it in editorials. The only reference to it is in one op-ed by the, uh, one of the editor owners who fled. That's it, that's the total cover. Well, that tells you how much we care about freedom of the press. It tells you what our libertarian standards are. Uh, let's move over to Guatemala. Uh, in Guatemala, uh, again, there was no censorship. Uh, the press was taken care of by the simpler device of just murdering journalists. Uh, about 50 journalists were murdered during the early 80s when we were enthusiastically, I mean, Reagan administration was enthusiastically supporting the war, uh, the really genocidal war, uh, and uh, uh, that took care of freedom of the press. Now, after the democratic opening that we proudly hail, uh, in 1986. Uh, in early 1988, one of the editors who had fled and was living in exile uh, decided to test the new democracy, and he returned to Guatemala, this is now last summer, uh, and of a spring, uh, spring, and he opened a small newspaper. It wasn't calling for the overthrow of the government, wasn't funded by foreign power, nothing like that. Mild, liberal newspaper. A as he returned to the country, he received death threats. Uh, they weren't reported. Uh, he then opened the paper, ran a couple of issues. Uh, right at that time, incidentally, there was, again, huge furor in the United States about La Prensa. Uh, the Washington Post was denouncing the Sandinistas as totalitarian because there was a newsprint shortage and La Prensa wasn't able to function as well as it could for a while. Uh, right at that point, uh, 15 armed men, obviously from the security forces, broke into the offices of this newspaper, firebombed and destroyed the offices, and kidnapped the nice night watchman. Uh, the next day, the editor, that, took, that was the end of that newspaper, the next day the editor had a press conference, which, as far as I know, no American reporter went to, uh, in which he said, obviously, there can't be freedom of press in this country. He received more death threats. He fled the country, accompanied to the airport by a Western ambassador to make sure he got there alive. Uh, what was the reaction to that? This was last summer. Well, zero. The Washington Post and the New York Times didn't even report it. Now, they didn't, it's not that they didn't know about it. We know that they knew about it, because if you really read carefully, you'll discover a couple of weeks later an oblique reference to it in a column on another topic and so on. It's just that it's not important. Well, again, that tells you something about our concern for freedom of the press. Uh, let's take the third obvious case, the leading U.S. client state, Israel. Um, Israel uh, is the major recipient of U.S. aid. So what's there? How do we react to violations of the freedom of press there? Well, there's many examples, so we can test it. Uh, for example, one of them was about a month ago. Uh, a month ago, on March 9th, 
the editor of a Nazareth journal had a press conference in the Beit Agron, it's called, what amounts to the National Press Club in uh, uh, Jerusalem, I guess. Uh, and he announced the fact that his newspaper had been closed by the security forces uh, on the grounds that it was support it had contacts with hostile elements. Uh, nobody said it had published anything wrong, anything critical to stay. In fact, everything that it published went through censorship. Uh, but it, the security claimed that it had contact with foreign elements, hostile elements, and that's enough to eliminate it. Uh, so his newspaper was closed. So we can check and find how much reporting there was of that. Notice that every American journalist knew about it. Uh, the press conference was given in the place where they pick up their mail and go to pick up what's called the news and so on and so forth, if you know how the media work. Uh, and uh, uh, it's just not important. Uh, it's by no means the first time. When La Prensa was closed, La Prensa was suspended right after this declaration of war by the United States, uh, the same month history was kind enough to set up a controlled experiment for us in this case, the same month, Israel closed two Jerusalem newspapers uh, on the grounds that they had contact with hostile elements. That one actually went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court announced that uh, while we have freedom of speech in Israel, it cannot be used to do anything possibly harmful to the state. And it said no government will allow a business, however legitimate, to function in its borders if it's supported by hostile elements. Well, that's La Prensa. Uh, how much reporting was there over that? They were closed permanently, incidentally, not suspended. Reporting on that was not quite zero. Uh, there was a reference to it in a letter of mine to the Boston Globe commenting on the total hypocrisy of the Neiman fellows. Uh, but uh, as far as I'm aware, that was the sole reference to it. Uh, so you can call that statistical error if you like. Uh, the, uh, 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 that's when La Prensa was opened. La Prensa was opened in October 1987, and again, history was kind enough to do a controlled experiment for us. And that month, two, another newspaper was closed in Israel, this time in Nazareth. No reporting of that. Uh, Palestinian press office was closed in Nablus. No reporting of that. Although the New York Times took the occasion of the closing of the Nablus press office to write uh, one of Thomas Friedman's regular odes to freedom of the press in Israel. Uh, well, that tells you how much we care about freedom of the press. In fact, if Nicaragua were to follow the standards of the U.S. clients, the whole uh, La Prensa would never have been published in the first place. Uh, the editors would either have been murdered or cut to pieces, uh, the thing would have been blown up, or uh, certainly they would have been expelled or jailed or something like that. Uh, but uh, So the, the, uh, that answers our question. That tells us that the civil libertarian passions are, can, are as serious uh, maybe less serious even than those of the enemies we, we, for whom we have contempt. In fact, the number of people in the United States who believe in freedom of the press, uh, I, I suspect they could fit in a, somebody's living room, and they would include virtually nobody who's uh, uh, um, pretending to be outraged by the press. So maybe they could fit in a telephone booth, in fact. Uh, well, we could proceed, but that's one case in point. Uh, in fact, coverage of Central American affairs, of which I'll make a couple of comments, uh, that provides almost a textbook example of the propaganda model. It has all the way through the 80s, and it still does. In fact, all long before. Uh, let me just briefly review the story, as I think you'll find it if you check. Until the late 1970s, uh, U.S. elite interests were very little, were not at all threatened, really, in Central America. And exactly as the propaganda model would predict, there was virtually no coverage, since there was no need to establish democracy, for example. In fact, you have whatever you like, because uh, we're able to rob the place without any problem. So there's virtually no coverage. Uh, now, there was one exception, one major exception to this, and that was Guatemala. Uh, in the early 1950s, as I mentioned before, uh, the US government geared up to uh, overthrow the capitalist democratic government, sort of New Deal-style government of Guatemala. Uh, with, for the interests of the United Fruit Company and other investors, uh, that CIA coup was presented by the government and by the media as an indigenous uprising to, fo I'm quoting now, to foil the efforts of the world Bolshevik conspiracy to take over the country. Uh, that's Arthur Kroc, the leading thinker of the New York Times at the time. Uh, the media spouted a whole variety of idiocies and lies that were concocted by the public relations industry and the government. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, uh, there's been a regular U.S. intervention ever since under Kennedy and under Johnson. And the United States has regularly intervened to maintain the, this one of the most murderous states in the world and to make sure that there's no further threat of democracy there. Uh, that's also not a topic for discussion. Uh, so I'll just give you one example. Uh, in about a week ago, March 26th, there was a cover story in the New York Times Magazine by Stephen Kinzer, who knows Guatemala well, I should say, uh, and it's about Guatemala. Uh, it, uh, he concedes in that that the democracy in Guatemala is not too attractive, but it's interesting that if you read that whole cover story in the Times, you will not find one word on the U.S. role in terminating Guatemala's democratic interlude 35 years ago or the murderous interventions ever since. In fact, the only reference to the United States is a kind of a vague reference to the lack of sufficient commitment uh, to our noble ideals in Guatemala. That's pretty impressive, actually, considering the actual historical record, and I should add that that's standard practice. Again, it's not ignorance. Kinzer, before he became a New York Times correspondent, wrote a rather good book about the CIA coup and the U.S. Uh, involvement in turning Guatemala into the charnel house it is and has remained with our help. Well, that was the one exception. However, by the late 1970s, alarm bells were beginning to ring in Washington and New York. The problem was that throughout the whole region, uh, popular organizations were beginning to develop, and there was a crisis of democracy springing up. They were beginning to offer the general population some means, maybe, to escape from the misery and the repression of their ordinary lives, uh, which Jean Fitzpatrick explains to us they don't really mind because the miseries of ordinary life are perfectly tolerable to these people as it looks from apartments in Georgetown, apparently. Uh, but they were beginning to uh, organize to escape the misery and repression that's, that's so tolerable to them and to take part in political life. And in Nicaragua, even worse, uh, the tyrant uh, who was the base for U.S. power in the region was overthrown by a popular revolution. Well, concerns mounted as the Sandinistas took power, and despite the enormous destruction of the U.S.-backed war, uh, they began to institute social reforms and development programs, and it looked as if they might be dangerously successful. Uh, we go back to the Tsar and Woodrow Wilson at this point to understand what the fears were, uh, and Washington and the media reacted exactly as anybody would expect who knows anything about American history, or world history for that matter. Uh, the reaction was that in Guatemala, the military regime launched a program of large-scale slaughter. That was supported tacitly during the Carter administration, and it was supported with open enthusiasm under the Reagan administration as the massacre approached a level of near genocide, in fact, genocide, as the Guatemalan bishops described it, with very heavy reliance on U.S. mercenary states. We have a whole network of states that do our work for us. And the media looked the other way, virtually no discussion. Uh, in El Salvador, same thing was beginning to happen for the same reasons, and the media barely noted it. State terror began to rise for the usual reasons in the last year of the, Reagan, of the Carter administration. Uh, the media suppressed it. The first large-scale massacre, big large-scale massacre, was at the River Sumpul in May 1980. That was suppressed. In fact, it was suppressed for about a year and a half. Uh, the me media also managed to avoid virtually entirely the Honduran refugee camps, which are the obvious place to go to find out what's going on in inner uh, El Salvador and get the wrong stories if you go there, so they didn't go. Uh, some people went, a congressional delegation went, breaking the rules, and they discovered that peasants were fleeing, I'm quoting the congressional report, a systematic campaign of terrorism conducted by the U.S.-backed forces including murder, torture, rape, the burning of crops in order to create starvation conditions, and a program of general terrorism and harassment. Uh, that report from Congress passed virtually without notice in the media. You can find something in the local newspapers, like Jerry Studd's local newspaper in Orleans, Massachusetts, is where I read about it, uh, not in the New York Times. Uh, in fact, uh, readers were assured at that time that quoting, there is no real argument that most of the 10,000 political fatalities in 1980 were victims of government forces or irregulars associated with them. That's the Washington Post. Uh, the argument, in fact, 
was not only uh, was, was completely overwhelming, as was conceded later. Uh, there were also extensive reports of extermination of peasants on a massive scale in the foreign press, mainstream foreign press, that was also suppressed. Uh, the, uh, the successor of the assassinated archbishop, uh, later in, in October 1980, uh, described what he called the war of extermination and genocide against the defenseless civilian population, but the readers of the American press didn't hear that. Rather, they were assured that there's no argument to say that the American supported forces have anything to do with it. Now, there was a period of actual reporting as the terror in El Salvador began to reach the scale and the style of Pol Pot, and that's accurate, uh, under the Reagan administration, uh, particularly when it seemed that the U.S. might be drawn into a conflict that would be harmful to its own interests. So the European uh, co European media coverage of these elections was radically different. There's an interesting study coming along about that. Uh, they uh, recognized, almost Western European countries recognized that the whole, that the elections were just a farce, uh, and, and they must be when they are conducted in an atmosphere of terror and despair, grisly rumor and macabre reality. That's Lord Chitmas, who observed the elections for the British Parliamentary Human Rights Group. Uh, this suppression of public opinion in El Salvador is kind of interesting, actually. It tells you something about American political culture, which is worth thinking about. Uh, the United States has unleashed an enormous repressive apparatus and military apparatus in El Salvador. It's poured huge sums of money into the country. If these efforts had even a remote relation to the interests and concerns of the population, then obviously their attitudes would be front page news, elementary logic. Well, what we discover, however, is that there's, not a, there's no interest in it at all. There's plenty of public opinion information about El Salvador. It's invariably suppressed. Actually, it's misleading to say that it's, it has the wrong message. That's one of the reasons it's suppressed. But suppressed is the wrong word. It's just that it's irrelevant. The irrelevance of the opinion of the people who are subject to our rule is elementary, like the rules of laws of arithmetic. I mean, you don't bother asking the donkeys and the chickens what they think. So who cares what the people think? Recall, notice that that's our attitude. No other explanation for the fact that the opinion of the people who we're saving doesn't matter. For example, the opinion that says 10% of them see a democratic process. You can guess which 10%. Uh, well, uh, the, uh, uh, there was a Central American Peace Accord in uh, August 1987, the Escapulas II Accord. After that accord, state terror increased in both Guatemala and El Salvador. Uh, these facts were largely suppressed. The assigned task at the time was to concentrate on Nicaraguan failures to live up to the accords, actually alleged failures, uh, and to highlight uh, alleged Sandinistic crimes, which very rarely approached the regular lesser abuses in El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras, and never came close to the frequent atrocities of the U.S. client regime. And the media performed on cue. That's extensively documented elsewhere. Uh, throughout this whole period, the reports of human rights groups, which are consistently quite horrifying, were given very little notice or suppressed altogether. For example, the New York Times did not even report an Amnesty International study last October, October 88, on the death squads in El Salvador, uh, which Amnesty International describes as agents of the security forces carrying out a government policy of intimidation. That's us that they're talking about, remember. Uh, and it's because this is the function of the death squads that it's not enough to kill people. It's necessary to leave them you know, beheaded by the side of the road because you have to terrorize people. It's necessary to take one case that was covered in the mainstream Canadian press but not considered appropriate for American eyes. Uh, it's necessary to leave women hanging from trees by their hair with their faces painted red and their breasts cut off, bleeding to death. That's the way you intimidate people. And if, if you have a government pro uh, policy of intimidation, that's the kind of thing you do. All of that's consistently either underplayed or totally suppressed. Uh, the fact is, throughout this whole period, in both of Washington's terror states, uh, Guatemala and El Salvador, the media helped implement uh, the government policies of torture and rape and mutilation and massacre uh, and general savagery, and we would recognize that if we were willing to face the truth. Uh, 
maybe an idea too absurd to comment on. Uh, Nicaragua, in contrast, was made the villain of the piece that follows the script of the Office of Public Diplomacy. Uh, and, in fact, the, its doctrines were accepted by most of the liberal opposition and still are with some tactical reservations. I've actually done several extensive studies of opinion columns in the Washington Post and New York Times, and it's quite remarkable to look at the constraints. There's debate over uh, the wisdom of contra aid. There's a reason for that. By 1986, uh, elite, American elites, what they call leadership groups in the polls, were overwhelmingly opposed uh, to the Contra option. The reason is it's too costly, it's too disruptive at home, creating one of these crises of democracy and so on. What they preferred was other measures that are available to a superpower that can be used to strangle and destroy a tiny independent country uh, and to reverse its social and economic programs. That's what's called kinder, gentler methods in current discourse. Uh, and of course, there's debate. Should we, tor should we destroy them by torture, as the Reagan administration wanted, or by kinder, gentler methods? That's the debate. Uh, and the media encourage debate over the most effective way to return Nicaragua to what uh, the Washington Post editors call the Central American mode, that is the mode of El Salvador and Guatemala, uh, and to ensure that Nicaragua would submit to, uh, I'm quoting, a regional arrangement uh, enforced by El Salvador and Guatemala, our worthy allies. That's Tom Wicker at the outer limits of dissent in the media. Uh, there are some striking differences between Nicaragua and the U.S. terror states. Uh, one is that whatever you think about the Sandinistas, they don't slaughter their own population. Uh, that's a striking difference. That difference I have never found mentioned in surveying hundreds of opinion columns in the national media. Uh, another striking difference, which is again uncontroversial, is that Nicaragua did carry out social reforms and they were pretty successful until the United States succeeded in reversing them by terror and economic warfare and so on. Uh, well, there's an occasional reference to that, maybe one or two percent of the opinion columns have a kind of a derisive comment about that kind of noise or statistical error. Uh, now, these omissions reflect something, again, about our political culture. They reflect the importance to us of things like mass slaughter uh, and brutal oppression uh, and social reforms. That's how important we think they are. Uh, with regard to Central America as a whole, the debate was, pretty, was limited to the best means and the efficacy of the means for uh, us to pursue our traditional aims of restoring democracy and so on just at the time when the U.S. government, with media and elite support, was demolishing any hope that democracy and social reform might be achieved, another fact that escapes the proper limits. Uh, the news columns kept to the same opinions as the opinion columns. Uh, there's a study of New York Times coverage of Nicaragua by Jack Spence, media critic in Boston, University of Massachusetts. Uh, he found that U.S. government, the U U.S. government provided most of the sources, uh, the U.S. proxy forces, the Contras, came second for sources about Nicaragua, about twice as many citations as the government. That discrepancy was increased still further by very broad coverage of the U.S.-backed internal opposition. Uh, coverage of the U.S. clients was furthermore overwhelmingly favorable. Uh, out of 33 stories on the Contras in early 1986, Spence found one that focused on human rights abuses. In other words, statistical error again. And there were a few other references scattered around to atrocities that by that time were reaching quite a remarkable scale, as the human rights groups were describing, but not in the press. Uh, the fact is that like the State Department and like Congress, the media preferred what human rights investigators were calling intentional ignorance. Uh, in El Salvador, in contrast, the pattern was sharply reversed. Uh, here, the official line, as laid down in New York Times editorials, I'll quote a few, is that the guerrillas are Marxist terrorists and things are improving under the democratic government of the honorable Mr. Duarte, the honest, reform-minded Christian Democrat who is trying to, trying to leave, lead his people to a better life while beset by implacable extremes, although he may have been less than rigorous in bringing death squad operatives to judicial account. To translate that into English, he has done nothing to curb the security forces that he praises for, in his words, their valiant service alongside the people against subversion, uh, 
while he conceded quietly that the masses were with the guerrillas when he assumed the role of front man for the war against the population. And news reporting was similar in style. Duarte was pictured as the victim somehow, not the agent uh, whose task was to support, to ensure adequate support for the, from Congress for the state terrorists whom he protected. Uh, in mid-1986, I reviewed six and a half years of editorials in the New York Times on El Salvador. Here's a couple of things that were never mentioned, not a word. The assassination of Archbishop Romero, the raid by the security forces on the church legal aid office to destroy records dealing with government complicity in the assassination, the destruction and closure of the university by the army with many people killed, the physical destruction of the independent media, which I already described or the Salvadoran state of siege, which began in March 1980 when Duarte joined Junta. That was the state of siege under which the atrocities were conducted with his backing and his constant apologetics. Now, in contrast, when Nicaragua declared a state of siege on October 15, 1985, the Times had an editorial bitterly condemning this demonstration of Nicaragua's lack of respect for democracy and human rights. The renewal of El Salvador's state of siege, which was far more draconian, two days later received no mention at all. In fact, it's never been mentioned. And the events ignored in the editorials were also largely ignored or suppressed uh, in the uh, news columns. The political opposition had been murdered by Duarte's security forces, so there was no need to spend any time on their problems. Uh, similarly, no second thoughts were aroused in the media uh, by the selection of one of the leading murderers to be the uh, uh, Duarte's Minister of Defense, a position he still holds. Uh, he had formerly been director of the National Guard, one of the most murderous organizations, uh, and there he had coolly explained that the armed forces are prepared to kill two to 300,000 people if that's what it takes to stop a communist takeover, and he had acted accordingly. Uh, when he was named Defense Minister, this mass murderer and torturer uh, was uh, subject to an article in the Times, he was described as a soft-spoken, amiable man who has a reputation as an excellent administrator. Uh, the article conceded that the guard under his command had been responsible for horrible atrocities that included the rape and murder of four American church women and the assassination of two U.S. labor advisors, but the Times added that in his defense, others contend that under his command, the National Guard is no longer considered the most abusive of Salvador's three security forces, which is doubtless an impressive achievement. Uh, the official line is that there are four democracies in Central America with elected presidents, and there's one dictatorship that has never had an election uh, that meets the U.S. the high standards of the United States, U.S. terror states. And media obedience to this quite remarkable absurdity is essentially unanimous kind of performance you get in the totalitarian state, try to find an exception. Uh, this, the astonishing media distortion of the Central American elections, that's another thing that's been adequately done, uh, documented elsewhere, I won't go on with it. Uh, the chief diplomatic correspondent of the New York Times, Thomas Friedman, he even re reach, reached the level of referring to what he called the diplomatic initiative opened by the leaders of Costa Rica, Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras and opposed only by the totalitarian Sandinistas, we're supposed to understand. Uh, the point is that no level of absurdity is too great once the state has spoken. That's the rule. Well, the media have, last point, the media have also had the problem of dealing with the fact that Washington has been committed to violence throughout this period. It's barred diplomacy in every possible way. That's common. Uh, the U.S. blocked Nicaraguan efforts to monitor the borders. It undermined the Contadora negotiations. It rejected the World Court decision. Uh, it vetoed a Security Council resolution calling on all states to observe international law and so on. All of this was with the acquiescence or the silence of the major media. And none of this has ever suggested that the United States is anything else but the world's leading peace-loving state. Now, in August 1987, much to the discomfiture of Washington, the Central American presidents agreed to a peace settlement, the Estipulas II Accord. Uh, the U.S. at once dedicated every effort to undermining it. The accord specified one indispensable element for peace in the region, namely ending any form of aid to indigenous guerrillas or to the Contras. 
the U.S. response was to escalate, to step up the number of illegal supply flights to the Contras. They had already reached the phenomenal level of about one a day in an effort to keep the proxy forces in the field. In the following months, they were virtually tripled. Uh, that was part of an effort to increase the level of violence, and it was successful. That was shown by terrorist attacks on civilian targets, which increased, as was hoped, with many casualties. Uh, the media cooperated by suppressing the whole story. That's pretty remarkable because, I mean, there's an occasional, I did a full media study on this. You find a couple of sentences scattered around, basically suppressed. New York Times totally suppressed. Uh, it's pretty remarkable because that was by far the most important thing that happened right after the Escapulas II Accords. It essentially wiped them out. Uh, Washington also rejected another central part of the Accords. They were based on the concept of symmetry. Various things had to happen simultaneously in all the countries. That was unacceptable for the United States for an obvious reason. It meant that the U.S. client states would have to adhere to the conditions on democracy and human rights, and that's an obvious impossibility uh, without destroying the whole structure and starting all over again. Uh, also unacceptable to the United States was international monitoring a threat to the U.S. intent to undermine the Accords and to the constant violations of the U.S. terror states. Well, by January 1988, U.S. pressure had succeeded in entirely dismantling the Accord. Nothing left of it. It eliminated the international monitors, uh, narrowed the application of the Accords to Nicaragua alone, and the media cooperated fully, another remarkable contribution to terror and repression in the service of power. Again, I've documented that in detail elsewhere. Uh, in March 1988, a ceasefire was reached in Nicaragua. The consequences are interesting. The agreement of the, this was virtually not reported. Let me tell you the facts. If you can check and find out for yourself. The agreement in March 1988 designated the Secretary General of the Organization of American States, General, Secretary General Suarez, as the official in charge of monitoring the agreement. The agreement stipulated that aid to the Contras must be limited to neutral carriers delivered in ceasefire zones within Nicaragua and in accordance with the Escapulas II agreements. If you check, you'll discover that Congress at once voted to violate every one of these conditions while declaring that it was here adhering to the terms of the Accords. I'll give you the details later, if you like. Secretary General Suarez, who was in charge of monitoring the agreement, wrote an official letter to Secretary of State George Schultz uh, in which he condemned these violations of the ceasefire agreements. Uh, homework problem, try to find a reference to that in the U.S. press. Uh, the media, in fact, adhered to the Washington version that the only problem was whether the treacherous Sandinistas would agree to permit humanitarian aid to reach the beleaguered and suffering resistance fighters. Uh, incidentally, the fact that the aid does not qualify as humanitarian by any standards whatsoever uh, was determined by the world court in the ignored ruling to the usual media silence. There is no such thing by legal standards uh, as humanitarian aid to the country. In February 1989, well, for the present now, the Central American presidents reached another agreement. By now, they were largely observing U.S. demands. Uh, Nicaragua, uh, uh, the uh, uh, the records were limited to Nicaragua, and the Nicaraguan request for international monitoring was rejected. But the obedience of the presidents was insufficient. Uh, the point is that the agreement called for dismantling the Contras, and it stipulated that any aid to them must conform to the Escapulas II Accords, which, ba which barred aid of any form, military, logistical, financial, propagandistic. Uh, there was one exception, aid could go for the purpose of demobilization, repatriation, or relocation. That's the one exception. Well, congressional doves agreed at once to violate these terms by providing $4.5 million a month to maintain the Contras as a military force in Honduras as a threat against Nicaragua. And you'll notice that that is in direct violation of the terms of the accord. Well, the media responded uh, by saying, by lauding the historic agreement, quoting, committing the administration and Congress to aid for the Nicaraguan rebels and support for the Central American peace efforts, which incidentally reject that aid as uh, inconsistent with them. That's Bernard Weinraub in the New York Times. And a New York Times editorial added, solemnly intoned, that 
U.S. goals are now consistent with the regional pact, uh, which they had just explicitly uh, violated. Now, in this case, the media advanced uh, beyond the usual falsification in the service of power to toleration of direct self-contradiction, actually in one sentence, uh, pretty, again, impressive performance. Well, without going on, we find the same pattern wherever we turn. Uh, the task of responsible insiders is to obey and to do their work. The torment of the tortured and suffering victims elsewhere is not their concern. That's the concern only of emotional extremists who don't comprehend the norms of respectable society. We need not dwell on the historical precedents to all of this, which are not hard to find uh, if we have the honesty to look for them. We have two mics, one in this aisle and one in this aisle, so if you'll just line up. If we can impose upon you to keep your questions and comments to one minute, please. Thank you. We'll start there and vote. Okay. What is your thinking now on the Khmer Rouge regime of the 1970s and the U.S.'s prior involvement? And how has your thinking changed on the subject from your views of the 70s? Did your experience in investigating the Cambodian situation in the 70s subsequently result in any change in your methodology of political analysis? Yeah. Well, the uh, conclusions that we reached, much as my colleague and I, Edward Herman, who uh, uh, published an analysis of the media coverage of the Khmer Rouge in 1979, uh, this was a very carefully done analysis. Nobody's ever found the slightest error in it. There's a reason for that. Uh, the, before we published it, and it was obviously a sensitive issue, we sent it around to most of the authentic uh, Cambodia scholars uh, in the world, and they had checked it and validated it and so on. And in fact, as far as I know, it was completely accurate. Uh, you can, that's also the conclusion of the scholarly literature. So if you look at the major scholarly work on Cambodia by Michael Vickery, who's the major, one of the two or three serious Cambodia scholars, uh, he refers to that fact. He notes that, that, that in, in the light of the vast amount of information that's come out since, he says there's virtually nothing that requires changing in this analysis. Uh, there's an interesting reaction to that. We didn't just discuss the Khmer Rouge. We discussed something else. Uh, and it's very interesting with the reactions when we bring it up. Uh, this was part of our effort to test the propaganda model. That's what the, it was in a two-volume work which was concerned with U.S. policy and propaganda. And in the test of the propaganda model, we tried to find paired examples, cases where history does a controlled experiment, sort of. So uh, we did a detailed investigation of two huge atrocities in the late 70s, the two major ones, in fact. Uh, one was the Khmer Rouge massacres, and the other was the U.S.-backed Indonesian massacres in Timor. And the two, it's a good choice. The two are rather comparable. I mean, at the point where uh, 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 where, the, uh, where the furor over the Khmer Rouge peaked in the United States, it was early 1977. Uh, at that point, the killings, the killings in Timor started about the same time. By the time furor peaked in the United States, uh, probably more people had been killed in Timor than in Cambodia, or at least it was roughly equivalent. Uh, and of course, relative to the population, it was vastly more in Timor, probably in fact the worst slaughter since the Holocaust. Uh, and we compared those two cases. And we found a, just a dramatic proof of the propaganda model. Uh, in the case of Cambodia, there was huge furor, vast exaggeration, fabrication of evidence, a repetition of lies after they were conceded to be lies, suppression of evidence. For example, the reports of the only, no there was one knowledgeable source at the, at the time, State Department intelligence, and in retrospect, their reports looked pretty good. Uh, that was suppressed. I mean, we reported it, but it was virtually suppressed because it was telling the wrong story. Uh, 
uh, that was one story. In the case of Timor, the thing was quite different. That was a US-backed invasion. The Carter administration provided 90% of the arms. Uh, the United States blocked anything at the UN to stop the aggression. Uh, the Carter administration offered new arms, contrary to what it reported to Congress right after Indonesia invaded. Uh, when Indonesia began to run out of arms in 1977, the Carter administration increased the aid to ensure that the atrocities would be consummated. The media response in this, the media had in fact had a fair amount of coverage of Timor in 1974. It was because of the breakup of the Portuguese Empire. It was a, they were concerned about that. It was a Portuguese colony. As the invasion started, the coverage dropped. By the time the uh, atrocities had reached a peak, real genocidal, uh, a, a coverage reached zero. Okay? That, those are the two cases in brief. You can look at the book and find the details, hundreds of pages backing this up. Now, what's the general response to this? Well, it's interesting. Uh, what we said about, team, first of all, the fact that we were comparing two cases has disappeared. That's unthinkable. Uh, what we said about Timor is off the agenda. No discussion of that. Uh, what we said about Cambodia, on the other hand, has caused enormous outrage, uh, uh, as if there was nothing wrong with it. Well, there was something wrong with it. We were challenging the right to lie in the service of the state, and that's unacceptable. Uh, the reaction has been extremely interesting. It teaches you something about the educated classes and the media. Uh, I'll give you one example, but there's plenty. I think the most interesting example is William Shawcross, who was very upset by what we did because we exposed his lies. In fact, I have a letter from him shortly before the book went to press uh, demanding that we remove every reference to him in the book. Uh, the reason he knew about this is because, as I say, we'd circulated the manuscript to lots of people and probably heard about it. Uh, Herman and I wrote back to him and said, well, you know, if you can show me something that's misleading or wrong, we'll be glad to correct it. Uh, we, in fact, even delayed publication of the book about a month to see if he would respond, and he wouldn't, and he didn't, and we went ahead with the publication of the book. Well, he responded in the way a good liberal intellectual does. Uh, he concocted the following intriguing story, which quickly became dogma. First part of the story is there was silence in the West over the Khmer Rouge atrocities. Well, that's a pretty audacious claim. Uh, about a week after the Khmer Rouge took, about two weeks or three weeks after the Khmer Rouge took over, the New York Times is already accusing them of genocide. Uh, about a year later, uh, the Reader's Digest, which reaches about 18 million people, had a huge story, you know, murder of a gentle land, I mean, denouncing them for the worst thing since Hitler. Uh, that was echoed in TV Guide, which reaches another 19 million people. At the other extreme, uh, there was the New York Review of Books, which concocted a whole series of fabrications, later quickly conceded to be fabrications, but then repeated as dogma ever since, uh, and then a whole lot of stuff in between. But it's convenient to believe that the West uh, avoided the topic. Then we can have deep thoughts about our uh, failure to uh, be critical enough of, the thir of third world opponents and so on. Uh, so therefore there was silence in the West. Well, that's repeated over and over again. Now, why was there silence in the West? Here the story becomes more interesting. According to Shawcross, first in the Washington Post, then in his book, Quality of Mercy, the reason for the silence in the West was left-wing skepticism. So in other words, the left has such awesome power that it was able to silence all the US Western media and all the Western governments. that terrified of us. If we're skeptical, they're going to be absolutely silent. That was his claim, and that's repeated by everyone. Now, how was this left-wing skepticism exercised? Well, he says the most extreme example is me, and he refers to this book of ours, which went to press in February 1979, two months after the Pol Pot regime was overthrown, and came out in November 1979, a year after it was overthrown. So we did it by magic. That is, a year after the Pol Pot regime was overthrown, our magic succeeded in silencing the entire West Western media and governments for the preceding five years. That's pretty impressive. I was kind of, you know, I never felt quite so powerful before. That story is repeated over and over again. In fact, what all of this shows is that there is, you cannot concoct an absurdity. I challenge you to concoct an absurdity which will not be, uh, which, no matter how ludicrous, which will not be accepted by the educated intellectual community if it's functional. If anything proves it, it's this. We have a details about this in Manufacturing Consent if you'd like to check up the facts.
It's the most extraordinary example I know. Uh, would, you, would you discuss the relevance and importance of the small critical journals, such as The Nation, uh, Zeta, etc., in, in the context of your veritable thesis of total conformity, absence of statistical error, etc.? Mm -hmm. Well, the, the alternative, me I mean, remember, I was talking about the national agenda setting media. In fact, it's kind of interesting that when you get down to the local media, there's often some deviation. So, for example, journals like, say, the San Francisco Herald Examiner often report accurately important stories that are suppressed by the New York Times. And I think there's a reason for that. They're just less important. Uh, it's, it's, just, you know, it's not a major newspaper. It doesn't matter much what people see there. Uh, so when you get down to the local newspapers, you really get a certain amount of variation. Uh, there are things, first, and they're also more subject to uh, pressure from people. So, you know, local groups can barrage the editorial office and get them to write something that is much harder to do with the national media. They're more important because they're setting the general agenda. The system can tolerate a little bit of noise. Uh, as far as the alternative press is concerned, it often does a very interesting job. Uh, I mean, I could talk about particular journals. My, I have to admit that I'm involved. I'm a writer for Z Magazine, so accept this with a grain of salt. But in my view, it's the most interesting political journal in the country. Uh, <laughs> you can judge that qualified by my comment. Uh, but uh, And the nation often has interesting things. For example, anything written by Alexander Coburn or Chris Hitchens is always worth reading, and some of the other things are too. Uh, and the same is true of a lot of the other alternative press. You know, against the current, monthly review, Guardian, all sorts. You learn all sorts. I mean, take, say, Timor, which I mentioned. If you were reading The Guardian in those years, you would have known about it, because The Guardian was reporting it, and reporting it accurately. It was The New York Times and The Washington Post and the, and the TV networks that were suppressing it. That's not the first time, incidentally. Uh, so, yeah, the alternative media perform a real service for people who uh, take the trouble to read them. Dr. Chomsky, I was senior class president at American University in 1970. I received a BA in sociology before AU. I spent two years at the Walton School in Washington, D.C. Walton was the nation's first alternative high school and had 15 students and three teachers. Before my two years at, at, at Walden, I spent three years locked up in Spring Grove State Mental Hospital in Catonsville, Mar Maryland because I meowed and claimed I was a cat. I am a functional schizophrenic who is finishing his third master's degree. I have written a book that has been published twice about collecting unemployment in insurance. I have a 49-page book outline for another book titled Government Benefits for the Mental Health Consumer, a Guide to 50 five zero Government Programs. So I am uh, having a lot of trouble finding a publisher. Could you please re re recommend to me either a publisher or a, an editor? Well, I wish, I, I think that's really important, and I wish I could help you, but I don't know. I just don't know, I don't have good contacts with the publishing industry or any mainstream thing. <laughs> Uh, this on this topic, I would think that you ought to be able to do it. Is there a uh, clinical psychology or a school of social work or something like that around here? I Th they're the kind of people who ought to know these things. I called up the um, uh, um, um, American Council on Social Work. They said uh -huh. they didn't publish. I no, they don't publish. But there ought to be people in these. I mean, I don't know the scene around here, but I'll bet you there are people on the faculty here. Uh, who know about these topics and would be able to help, but it would know where to go. But I just don't know. Okay, thank you. Yeah. There's a very sharp example here in D.C. right now of an attempt to manufacture consent for a direct police clampdown. And in fact, I'd call it a fascist and racist crackdown on a whole major section of people, all in the name of the so-called war on drugs. D.C. has been declared a murder capital, even though an objective look at the statistics show that there are other places that are far worse. Recent studies in this area show marked, actually, signif excuse me, significant declines in drug use, although we're still being treated to hysteria around drugs being the cause of things. The fact that millions of people are being forced to live in worse conditions now than they did in the 60s when cities erupted is not being spoken to, and drugs are being declared the cause of all social ills. Uh, 
and yet people like the drug czar and so on can manage to find two poison grapes, but unable to find tons of illegal drugs coming into this country. Um, <laughs> I'd be interested in knowing your assessment of the situation. Yeah. Well, I, I'm not competent to talk about the Washington case, except in one respect. When you refer to D.C. as a murder capital, I actually agree, though not quite in the sense that you were talking about. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> as far as the drug story is concerned, that's an interesting one. And it's a very, I won't try to outline it, but the fact is that it's, it's one that we really ought to be concerned about, and a lot's known about it. Uh, the, in the post-war period, when the drug business became a serious affair, it really started in southern France uh, as part of the CIA efforts to break up the French labor unions, which were part of a global effort to destroy the resistance and the radical democracy that came out of the Second World War and to restore traditional elites. This was done everywhere in the world. If there were an honest history of the post-war world, chapter one would be about this. Actually, I have an article about it in January Z, which will express my own views. In that context, it was necessary to split up the French labor unions. You want to break up unions, you need thugs. You need guys to get down to the waterfront and break people's bones and that sort of thing. If you want thugs, you go to uh, uh, the mafia. Uh, the same was true in Italy, incidentally, where we had to destroy the working class organizations, and that meant kill union leaders and so on, and the obvious place to do it is to turn to the mafia. Well, the mafia had been pretty well wiped out by the fascists. Fascists tend to run a pretty tight ship, and there was no mafia. Uh, and the United States reconstituted it. As the U.S. forces came up through Sicily and then southern Italy, they reconstituted the mafia. And in southern France, uh, the mafia was, the Corsican mafia in this case, was organized and paid off one of the early CIA operations to provide uh, strike breakers and so on to help break up the French labor unions and to ensure something that was important at that time, that France could send arms to Indochina uh, to suppress the Indochinese, what's called the defense of Indochina by France. It actually is called that, believe it or not, by, say, McGeorge Bundy in his recent book and others. Uh, the, uh, as I said, nothing is too absurd. Uh, the, uh, the, the, you know, the mafia, maybe those guys like to break bones, you know, but they also like to be paid off. Uh, and one of the ways of paying them off was allowing them to run the drug racket, which had been essentially destroyed by the fascists. This was done for the Corsican mafia. I expect, although this hasn't been documented, that it was also done for the Italian mafia, which was used to uh, murder union leaders and so on, and part of the background for breaking up the Italian labor movement which was a serious business. The Italian resistance was a very strong movement, had to put a lot to break it up. Uh, the uh, the anti-Nazi resistance. And, uh, the, uh, uh, well, that was the origins, apparently that was the origins of the modern international drug racket. Uh, that was what became the famous French connection. For a long time, Marseille was the heroin capital. It appears to be a follow-up of this. By the late 1960s, the drug center of the world was apparently shifting over to Southeast Asia to what's called the Golden Triangle, um, around Burma and Thailand and that area. And that was connected with CIA efforts to uh, organize what was called a clandestine army. It was called clandestine because the media were able to keep it secret. Everybody else knew about it if you wanted to. But there was this big clandestine army of Highland tribesmen which was organized in classic imperialist fashion, like you know, like the British organizing the Gurkhas and so on. I like the Contras, in fact, uh, to uh, try to suppress the lowland Lao. Well, you know, that takes money. Uh, and the Highland tribes were growing opium, so the CIA came along and took the opium for them and flew it into Saigon, which incidentally led to the destruction of the American army. Uh, and uh, uh, that came, became the drug capital of the world. Uh, and that's the way it's gone since then. Uh, if you, uh, you know about the Contras and the drugs and Noriega and all this story, I don't have to tell you about it. Uh, and there's a good reason for that. I mean, clandestine covered activities need money. They need untraceable money and lots of it. And one of the best places to get that money is drugs. So it's natural that uh, clandestine activities, what we should really call international terrorism, because that's exactly what they are. Inter so let's call it that. International terrorism uh, require, it naturally goes along with uh, 
uh, state-directed international terrorism, that is large-scale international terrorism, the kind we orchestrate, uh, that does require, you know, it naturally goes along with the drug racket. Uh, it's to be expected. And that's why uh, you find this connection which runs up to the present. And there's never going to be a serious U.S. attack on the drug racket, I don't think, because it's just too integral a part of international activity. Hi. Hi. My name is Peter Schultz. I'm a freshman at American University. Um, Dr. Shomsky, um, the conclusion I would draw from uh, your talk on, on the mass media in our society and the role they play is that, that it's an outcome of the structure of the society itself. Um, I have two related questions. One, um, what would you say the, the best way to change the society, what would you say the best way to change it? I'm on the, I'm on the amplifier now. How would you change, how would you change uh, this society towards something in which necessary illusions don't exist? And um, secondly, why do you choose not to use um, widely used Marxist terms in describing the society that exists, replacing terms such as ruling class which with ruling elites, uh, a uh, general population with working class and that sort of thing. I mean, the other well, way. Well, as for the second part, I don't use the terminology because I don't find it very interesting or helpful or useful. Uh, in fact, I mean, if you do, okay. I think it's mostly misleading. Uh, be pre. I mean, I'll be frank. I just don't think there's much in the social sciences in the way of theory. I think most of what happens in the world, to the extent that we understand it at all, which is not very much. To the extent that we understand it at all, it's not very much hidden, you know, kind of on the surface. Now, you can obscure it. You can make very complicated theories which make it look obscure, and in fact, I think a large part of the social sciences and the humanities are committed to that, uh, for good professional reasons. After all, you've got to have a profession and that sort of thing. But uh, I'm just not convinced that the theories help you very much. At least they don't help me very much. Most of the time I don't understand them, for one thing. And uh, what I think I do understand can be described without them. Uh, so uh, if you're helped by reading Althusser or something, okay, I'm not. To me, it looks like gibberish. Uh, but uh, uh, so I don't use it because I don't think it's helpful. You know, if you think it's helpful, fine. Uh, the, uh, it, as far as, you know, if you talk about these things as theories, you know, it's the kind that I'm used to, at least, I know about in other fields, which have principles and conclusions and so on. I don't see any of that structure. Uh, I should say that the whole idea of Marxism strikes me as kind of odd to begin with. I mean, if there's such a thing, I mean, Marx, the concept of Marxism belongs to the history of organized religion, just like Freudianism or any other kind of ism. But notice you don't have concepts like that in the sciences like nobody's an Einsteinian, let's say, or a Planckian, or anything like that. And the reason is, in the sciences, people aren't gods. You know, there are people who did some interesting work, you know, maybe important, maybe even revolutionary work. They obviously made mistakes, you know. You try to improve and correct their mistakes. If you're still repeating what somebody said a century ago, uh, and trying to figure out why it's exactly true, you know that you might as well throw it out, you know. Nothing that was said a century ago could possibly still look true if there was a field there. I mean, that's kind of like automatic. Uh, so if there is a concept like, say, Freudianism or Marxism, it really belongs to the history of theology. In my view. Uh, uh, human, it's raising a human being to divine status. And that doesn't seem to me to make much sense except in theology, uh, if that makes sense. But uh, so that's why I don't use that. Uh, as far as, uh, I, I don't mean to say that there aren't insights there. You know, I think in the so-called Marxist literature, I would rather see it called something else. Uh, sure, there are insights, and any sane person ought to learn from them. And, you know, I try to do it as much as I can. As much as I can understand it, I try to do it. Uh, the, uh, as to changing the society, I mean, I think there are a lot of things to say about that, and I don't want to be glib. Uh, there, I'll just refer to literature. In fact, there's very good literature that I agree with, at least written by people like Robin and Hanel, for example, and Mike Albert. Uh, so I'll just refer you to their books. I think they give a good, reasonable outline of what a more democratic society, a libertarian society, ought to look like. Now, how do you get there? Well, you know, no big secrets. Uh, you get there the way every other big social change in history ever took place. Uh, you get there by doing the things that uh, always disturb elites, by being one of these uh, 
you know, itinerant uh, preachers and mechanics of the 17th century and running your little printing press and trying to inform people or get them to inform themselves and to organize and to press and to take things over and to run their own affairs and to take over the institutions and so on. That's the way you do it. That's the way social changes have taken place. There's, if there's any other way, nobody has ever invented it. Uh, that's the way it's happened throughout history. It's a lot of hard work, uh, but as far as I'm aware, there's no big secret. Uh, nothing much understood that, wasn't, that isn't obvious. Uh, what's, uh, I, I, again, believe that a lot of the talk about how to do it is a way of defending ourselves from the ugly and demanding task of doing it. Uh, and I don't think it's hard to figure that out. I was wondering if you had any thoughts on the recent effort of the I was wondering if you had any thoughts on the recent effort of the Washington Post and the New York Times to cast um, president elect Cristiani in El Salvador as a moderate and um, a second related question would I have um, many people think that there's going to be um, massive human rights violations on the scale of the early, early 1980s in El Salvador um, has there been any success successful models of media pressure campaigns that have um, been successful in forcing newspapers like the Washington Post to report um, these human rights violations as they truthfully occur in these situations, such as might happen in a couple of months. Um, there ha I, uh, as for portraying Christiane as a moderate, uh, in my view, that's a little bit like portraying Ronald Reagan as president of the United States. It doesn't really matter much whether he's a moderate or not. He's not the president of El Salvador. Uh, the president of El Salvador is who it always was, the armed forces. Uh, the only question is who's fronting for them. Uh, and uh, I think we ought to recognize that. It would, maybe Christiani is a moderate, whatever that means. Maybe he's nice to his dog or something. I don't know. <laughs> but that doesn't seem to me the relevant question. Uh, the relevant question is how is the U.S. run terror system going to respond to the apparently unsuppressible popular organizations that keep popping up every time you decapitate them. Well, one way of responding to that is what's called the Guatemalan solution. You just murder them all. Uh, and I guess that that's what they'll try to do if nothing else works. Uh, uh, how can you press the press? I, on, on the specific case of covering human rights issues, I don't know that it's ever been tried. But certainly on other issues, it has been tried, and it works. In fact, it's you know very little bits of pressure often have effects. Uh, let me. I mean, the effects are often slow, but they're nonetheless significant. And if the scale of the efforts were larger, it could be quite significant. Let me tell you one case. Uh, take, say, FAIR, which I mentioned before, Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting. Very good group and really could use support. I think they do terrific work on this issue, the best I know. Uh, well, a very good journal also called Extra, which comes out once a month and tells you a lot about these things. Uh, there was a, hey, let me give you one example. Part of the whole... Uh, media government campaign is that uh, Nicaragua has been sending miraculously undetectable arms to El Salvador. Now, if you read the government propaganda, like the State Department reports, which incidentally were dismissed with complete derision by the world court, but are always accepted by the media, uh, if you read them, uh, you discover that these arms are supposed to be coming across the Gulf of Fonseca. Now, David McMichael, who some of you may know, is the CIA analyst in charge of analyzing this material uh, during the relevant period, the early 80s. He testified at the World Court hearings. He made a couple of interesting observations. Uh, he pointed out that the Gulf of Fonseca, as I, if I recall the details correctly, 30 kilometers wide. Uh, it has an island in the middle of it, Tiger Island, where the U.S. has some super sophisticated surveillance system. Uh, the whole U.S. Navy's floating around in that little area. Uh, Navy SEAL teams are all over the radar, can pick things up all the way up and down the Pacific coast, and so on and so forth. They've never found a canoe, you know. Uh, well, of course, let's concede that Nicaragua is, you know, like a technological superpower, and the United States is somehow, you know, really, you know, weak little country, so maybe they're getting it through somehow. But that's what we're supposed to believe. You know, if you want to be a loyal citizen, that's what you, you don't laugh when you see this. Uh, well, the, uh, because it's crucial that uh, Nicaragua be supplying arms to the guerrillas. I mean, after all, we've got to pretend, you know, we've got to pretend that the Contras are guerrillas. 
Well, the Contras get three supply flights a day. You know, another realism in history ever heard of anything like that. <laughs> I mean, they're better armed than the American Army half the time. Uh, but somehow they got to be grilled. So it must be that the FMLN is a foreign implant too. So they're getting canoes across the Gulf of Fonseca that we can't detect. That's the story. Uh, uh, th and this story goes on and on. Now, here's where fair enters. In August 1987, right after the Central American Accords, when it was crucial to maintain this symmetry idea, uh, James Lemoyne, the New York Times correspondent, wrote something like this. He said, there's ample evidence that the FMLN guerrillas, the Salvadoran guerrillas, are receiving their arms from Nicaragua and that without that constant flow of arms, they couldn't continue. Uh, that's what he wrote. Well, Fair wrote a letter to the New York Times, simple letter. They said, could you please ask Mr. Lemoyne to share with us his ample evidence? since the U.S. government hasn't been able to come up with it. Uh, well, the letter wasn't printed, but they did get a uh, response from, I think it was Joseph Lellyfeld, who's the foreign editor, somebody here, no, Joseph, you correct me if I make mistakes here, yeah. Joseph Lellyfeld was the foreign editor at the Times. He wrote him back a personal letter saying something like, well, you know, maybe Lemoyne exaggerated a little or something like that. Well, after that, uh, he said maybe Lemoyne was imprecise, I think that was his word. Uh, well, you know, after that, the Times had ample occasion to correct the imprecision, and they used it, namely by repeating the same falsehood. There's story after story after story saying the same thing by Lemoyne, by others, and so on. Uh, Fair kept after them. Uh, finally, they got a letter from Joseph Lellyfeld, I think it was three or four months later, saying that he's assigned James Lemoyne to do a story in which he's going to present the ample evidence. Well, six months went by, no story. Uh, in Extra, the journal affair, there was a small article reporting the facts that I just mentioned. And about two months after that, Lemoyne finally had his story, which presented the ample evidence. This is now nine months after he was assigned to the task and about, um, I think, 15 months after the original story came out. You read the story in the Times, turns out the ample evidence has been reduced to no evidence. He said, in fact, if you look at it carefully, it turns out that the arms is he says, maybe they're getting some arms from Honduras and you know, Guatemala and places like that, but there don't seem to be any arms from Nicaragua. Uh, that took care of the ample evidence. Uh, incidentally, uh, the, here's an example of fair pressure, which worked. Partly, notice, it worked because it had become impossible to keep the Contras in the field. As soon as there's a very dramatic difference between the Contras and the FMLN, uh, it takes a disciplined press not to point this out. The Contras were maintained in the field with a level of supply and support that is unheard of, undreamt of, in any guerrilla struggle. Uh, the FMLN has no known outside support, and somehow they're ineradicable. Uh, and, uh, and they're fighting a military force, which on paper at least is stronger than the army of, uh, of Nicaragua by a big margin. Just look at its supplies and stuff. Well, you know, maybe it's another one of these miracles, like William Shawcross must be. Uh, actually, it's not a miracle, and if you bother to think for a minute, you'll figure out the answer. But the answer is unacceptable, so therefore, you know, it didn't happen. Uh, by uh, when Congress said that they weren't going to continue over military support, the Contras mostly broke for the border, and by late last year, it was impossible to maintain them in the field except at a low level. So then it was legitimate to say, well, you know, maybe they're not getting armed. But here's a case where fair pressure did some work. Well, let me continue with the story where there was no pressure and therefore nothing happened. Uh, last fall, in last November, the most important defector yet, to my knowledge, defected, a guy named Horacio Arce, who was the uh, head of FDN intelligence, basically head of counterintelligence. He defected in Honduras, went to Mexico. He was interviewed extensively uh, in Mexico. Not a word appeared. The U.S. press, to my knowledge, except one small press service in Washington, D.C., uh, run by William Robinson, which is now unfortunately defunct with the name money. Uh, the, uh, uh, but the, you could find the testimony, you know, translations from the Mexican press and so on. And the testimony was very interesting. He had a lot of interesting things to say about all sorts of topics. But one topic was about arms. Uh, he said that the Contras are selling, giving away, are selling their arms to the Honduran army which is totally corrupt, of course, uh, and the Honduran army is selling them off to the FMLN guerrillas. Uh, well, that meant, if you think for a moment, that in a couple of months, Soviet-style arms were going to appear in El Salvador. The reason is the Contras 
are supplied with Soviet-style armaments, like Chinese AK-47s and East German and this and that and so on. Now, up until now, the FMLN guerrillas had like M16s and American arms because they're taking them from the Salvadoran army. They're buying them or capturing them or something. But you could predict that in a couple of months they're going to have uh, Soviet arms. Well, it happened. Six months later, big story from the State Department, huge new shipment of Soviet arms from Cuba and Nicaragua and all these bad places, uh, which proves that Gorbachev is mysterious about the taunt and the Sandinistas are up to their dirty work again all repeated in the press, yeah, they got Soviet-style arms, because now they're getting them from the Contras, not just from uh, uh, the American army. So they get the other source of US support is now supplying them. Uh, well, uh, it, now there wasn't any pressure about this. Nobody was battering down the media doors saying, why don't you report the testimony of Horacio Arce, who had many other things to say too, incidentally, very illuminating ones, okay, if you like. Uh, and there was no pressure, so nothing happened. So then this story came out. Well, that's an indication of things that can be done. And they can be done every day, you know, but it takes work. I mean, they're not going to get done by themselves. You know, it takes work. In the uh, face of blatant uh, censorship and uh, adversity, I just want to thank you for your years of courage and fortitude in speaking the truth. Thanks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that makes it worth it. <laughs> Hi. Um, my question pertains to something, Susan, I don't know, uh, pertains to something um, on which there is more coverage in the mass media. Maybe that should warn me of something right away. But what are, what's your perception of events in the Soviet Union, uh, changes in domestic and foreign policy there, and whether or not a changing perception of the Soviet Union here is going to remove the popular justification of Soviet aggression for our own aggressive foreign That's policy. That's a very important question. Uh, the question had to do with the changes going on in the Soviet Union, particularly foreign policy, the perceptions of that here, and how that's going to affect uh, the kind of stuff I was quoting before. Remember, say, Huntington's quote about, you have to create the misimpression that it's the Soviet Union that you're fighting when you decide to destroy some, you know, some church-based uh, peasant association in El Salvador or whatever. Uh, so how's that going to change if the Soviet Union doesn't look so terrifying? Well, that's a very interesting question. Uh, the Soviet Union has been necessary for two things in the United States, two crucial things. One for frightening, uh, mainly, for, uh, well, really one thing, for frightening the domestic population, and there's two purposes to that. One purpose to that is we have a world empire that we've got to control, and that means control by force. And if we're going to intervene somewhere, then it has to be exactly as Professor Huntington pointed out. It has to be by creating the misimpression that it's the Soviet Union we're fighting. This misimpression, incidentally, runs all the way through U.S. intelligence. I mean, U.S. intelligence is, like most intelligence services, I guess, is fanatically ideological and cannot see the most elementary things. Because it, what it needs, it sees, kind of like educated intellectuals. Uh, just to give you one example, the most dramatic one I know, uh, when the Pentagon Papers came out in uh, 1972 or so, uh, one, whatever, uh, I, when I read through them, I noticed one a very dramatic fact. There was 20 years of intelligence reported there, uh, CIA, DIA, the whole business. Uh, so the, uh, the obvious question to ask and when you look for is, what did they have to say about North Vietnam's intentions? What were they up to? Well, that's interesting. Turns out there is not one paper that uh, ever raised the question whether North Vietnam might be following its own national interest and not merely following the orders of the Kremlin or China, either one would do, or the Sino-Soviet conspiracy. Actually, there's one staff paper which never went beyond being a staff paper which raises this question. Now, you know, that's a level of ideological fanaticism which is kind of hard to imagine. I mean, whatever you think about North Vietnam, the fact that they were following their national interests is pretty obvious. Everyone knew they were nationalists. Uh, but you couldn't raise that question because even at the internal to intelligence, you had to create the misimpression that it's the Soviet Union you're fighting. In fact, if you look at the details of this, it's kind of incredible. I, have, I wrote about it in a book called For Reasons of State that came out right at that time. Uh, intelligence was assigned that when the United States decided to aid France, 
intelligence was essentially assigned the task of proving what had to be true, that North Vietnam was an agent of the Sino-Soviet conspiracy, because that just had to be true. Otherwise, how come we're defending, we were defending Vietnam from somebody, it can't be from the Vietnamese, so it's got to be from the Sino-Soviet conspiracy, so therefore it's true. Well, intelligence has a task of proving it, and they tried. You know, the intelligence record shows that for a couple of years they did their work. They looked for connections and so on. They came up with a crazy, the oddest conclusion. They came up with a conclusion that of all the countries in Southeast Asia, North Vietnam seems to be the only one that doesn't have any connections to China or Russia, uh, one of the two bosses. Well, what do you do with that? Well, it's not hard. You just have to know how to be a well-trained intellectual. That proves it. Uh, the conclusion that was drawn from that was that the Russians or the Chinese or whoever runs them, can, that they are so loyal and so obedient, they don't even have to send them messages. They can just count on them and do everything they want. So that was the conclusion. Well, okay, what's going to happen when you lose all this stuff? Uh, actually, there's another reason why we need the Russians. There's got to be a method for frightening the public into paying a subsidy to high technology industry. There's, there's a method by which you keep high technology industry functioning. Free trade is okay for editorials, but in the real world, nobody believes it. Uh, the parts of the economy that work are the parts that are government protected and government subsidized. And the foreign economies that work are the same. And you look at American history, it's highly protectionist and so on and so forth. Well, you take a look at the American economy, there's two parts that are competitive internationally. Uh, one of them is capital intensive agriculture and the other is high technology industry. They're both government subsidized. Uh, agriculture, everybody knows. Uh, high technology industry is just the Pentagon. Uh, the government provides a market for high technology production and it provides a subsidy. Of course, that means the public provides a subsidy for research and development and so on and so forth. And also a cushion for the corporate manager. You know you've got that cushion. If you can sell something in the commercial market, you do it. If you don't, the taxpayer will buy it. Uh, and therefore, that sort of functions. Well, what do we do if we lose that? I mean, how, how do you convince people to do that? Well, the Russians are coming, or, you know, the Libyans are coming, or something like that. Uh, but suppose you lose that threat, well, you got a problem. Questions are not, in most places, part of the economics department, because they're not economic problems. And they're not part of the political science department, because that deals with, you know, electoral politics or something. In fact, they're not part of anything, so therefore you don't study them. But they're the real problems. Uh, and what are you going to do if the Russians aren't around to uh, terrorize the population? Well, there's concern about that. In fact, the literature on this is very interesting. Uh, you look at the Sovietologists, even the, the liberal ones, like, say, Jerry Ho or whatever his name is from, I think, Brookings, uh, has a recent article in which he says, we can't be too sure that the optimists are right. Maybe Gorbachev's methods will succeed. It's an interesting turn of phrase. In other words, the optimists think he's going to fail. But, you know, you can't be sure. Uh, maybe it'll succeed, then what do we do? Uh, and in fact, that's a pretty frank way of putting it. And sort of, this was an international economics journal, so nobody's going to read it, but people are safe. Uh, but um, that's part of the thinking. Uh, actually, in the public domain, uh, one interesting indication of how people are thinking was in the l last article, in the New York Times at the end of every year, runs a bunch of articles in which all kind of, you know, wise people uh, sum up important things in the world. And their summary article on this problem was written by a guy named Dimitri Symes, who's uh, from the chief senior associate of the Carnegie Foundation for International Peace, or whatever it's called. And that was a very interesting article. I think it was December 28th from the Times. Uh, he says, and he sort of indicates that he says that all this business going on in Russia is kind of confusing things that were simple and you know problems but there's some silver linings in the cloud uh, even if it works uh, the sil and then he goes on to say what the silver linings are well the main one he says is and it's an interesting one uh, one the two really uh, well actually three one is we'll be able to shift the burdens of NATO onto our allies so-called allies actually our enemies uh, Europe Europe, basically, and that's important because they're getting too big for the riches and we can make them harm their economies more and that sort of thing. So that's one thing. Uh, the other thing which is more important is he says we will not be subject to manipulation by third world countries on the matter of the debt and such things. The idea is if they've got the Russians there and they can play them off against us, 
we can be manipulated by the undeserving poor, you know. And we won't have to worry about that if they don't have this, uh, this play that they can work with. But the most important thing, and the most interesting one, is he says, uh, this will remove the constraints on the use of military violence in the world to enforce our goal in the third world. Now that's interesting, and what he's, it's an insight of the, you know, one of the interesting things is that this Soviet business is beginning to let reality come out. The ideology is that we deter the Russians and we contain the Russians. The truth is the opposite. They deter us and they contain us. Uh, we're afraid, and he gives examples. He says, for example, in the early 70s, uh, when oil prices, he thinks, were going up too high, we couldn't invade because we were afraid it would lead to a global war in the Middle East and uh, maybe the Russians would get in and, no, it's dangerous. So we were deterred. But if the Russians back off, we won't be deterred anymore. We won't be contained anymore. And therefore, we can use military violence if those Arabs get the wrong idea. Uh, the second, he gives two examples. The second one's Nicaragua. He says the Sandinistas will have to think twice uh, if the Russians don't put an umbrella over them. Then we'll be able to attack them directly. We won't be deterred any longer by the threat of the uh, thing breaking out in a nuclear war. Now that picture is, that's an interesting point, and it sort of, as I say, lifts the veil on a lot of mysticism. Uh, and uh, uh, it's a point that's repeated over and over again in the press, like the Washington Post and so on, regularly runs editorials and news columns uh, in the major press runs things about how to prove his good intentions, you know, to show that he really has new thinking, uh, Gorbachev has to agree not to deter us in our attack against Nicaragua. That's not the words they use. Uh, the words they use is he has to stop supporting Nicaragua. Nicaragua has to disarm. The one country in Central America which is under foreign attack has to be disarm. Uh, and uh, first of all, has to stop providing them with economic aid. That'll prove his good intentions. That'll prove he's serious about detente. Well, there's a logic behind that. To prove that he, what we call detente is eliminating the deterrent threat that prevents us from using violence in the world wherever we want to use it. Uh, and that's the silver lining in the clouds. You know, so, we can, so even though there's problems about all this stuff, we can still make use of it somehow. I think this is all going to be a very serious business in the next couple of years, to tell you the truth. Uh, and it's too big to talk about now, but just to sketch something, I, I think what's happening, it looks to me for about the last 20 years in fact, is that the world is breaking up into three major blocks. Uh, there's a kind of a Europe, European block, which you know, sort of around Germany roughly. There's a yen-based block, you know, Japan and its periphery, and there's a dollar block, which we just brought Canada into it as a new colony, it was called free trade. Uh, it's, it includes whatever part of Latin America is viable. That's one of the reasons they're so worried about the debt crisis, I think. They're going to try to work out some way to get taxpayers to pay off the banks so that, uh, like they're doing with the savings and loan thing, uh, so as to get Latin America viable enough so we can bring it into our relatively closed area. And how Europe fits into, how Russia fits into all of this is going to be very tricky. Europe and Japan are both trying to reconstitute what amount to more or less traditional colonial imperial relations to Russia. You know, investing, getting resources out, and so on. The Japanese want to do it. They've got plenty of capital and there's plenty of resources in Siberia. They want to do it there. Uh, Germany's doing it uh, in Western Europe. If that happens, the United States will be a second-class power. Uh, the United States will be a, what the geopoliticians have always regarded it as, an island power off of Eurasia, which is now united. That's the nightmare of planners. Uh, and uh, how we'll react to that, I don't know. But it could, in, in the past, that's the kind of thing that led to global wars. Uh, probably it can't anymore because countries are too interdependent and there's too much flow of international capital and just weapons are too destructive. But how are you going to handle that situation, I think, is very unclear. That's probably going to be a major problem in the, in the future. So I think that question points to major serious issues. Uh, Dr. Shomsky, I would like to thank you for your extraordinary efforts to uh, your extraordinary success at documenting Western atrocities in the developing world. Whenever I run into a fascist I just can't argue with, I leave him with a couple of the titles of your book, and uh, more than a few of them have been changed, I think. But. Um, uh, the question I'd like to ask you about is, uh, if you accept the premise, as I do, 
that the major media outlets in the developing world and the developed world are under centralized business control and that these media businesses go to government press conferences for their information first. Uh, then it, it's easy to come to a, a logical conclusion that the, uh, the national security uh, powers in various nations are in fact have strategic control of the media outlets. Um, my question is, do you view that a, a progressive revolutionary movement must regain control of these media outlets in order to be successful? Or do you think that, uh, that somehow uh, there is an alternative uh, 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 system of propaganda that can allow uh, a, a major break with, uh, with the uh, ruling elites? Uh, as a secondary, are you familiar with any uh, CIA, active CIA personnel in Western media institutions currently? I mean, I probably am, but I'm not consciously familiar with them. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I don't know that such and such a person was working for the CIA. It wouldn't surprise me. I mean, there are people who say they have worked with the CIA, like Stanley Carno, you know, who said that it's part of a journalist's job. He published the fact that it's part of a journalist's job to be in friendly relations with the CIA. Okay, so he probably is, but uh, I don't know myself. I wouldn't know that kind of thing. Uh, as to the first point, I mean, I don't think there, it's kind of a chicken and egg thing. I mean, it seems to me, you know, you want to democratize the society. You want to democratize the media. And the two things go together. And you do what you can. I mean, it's, it, it, one shouldn't feel that the system is all powerful. It's very far from that. I mean, it's always breaking down, you know, because of stupidity, because of impossibility of controlling, all sorts of reasons. And the more there's popular pressures and organization and so on, the more systems of power they always have to adjust to them somehow. And there's plenty of, you know, there's plenty of opportunities inside the institutions. I mean, they're very good journalists who understand the whole thing perfectly. They understand how it works. They use the system wherever you can use it. And they do very good things. They get things through that you wouldn't see otherwise. Uh, and you can, things can be done in, they can do more if they have outside support. So there's lots of things that can be done inside. There's lots of things that can be done in developing popular organization and pressures and so on. And one end result of this should be general democratization of social institutions, including the media. And I don't think it, it's not, an, you know, it's not, these things are not, institutions aren't fixed for all time. They keep changing and they change because of uh, popular pressures and struggle. Oh, look, take say freedom of the press. So that's a very important thing. We have more of it than we had in the past. In fact, until about the First World War, freedom of press barely existed in the United States. That's literally true. Uh, seditious libel, which I mentioned before, that actually wasn't struck down by the Supreme Court until 1964. Now, it's almost 200 years before we got rid of the very the thing which makes it just not a free society. Uh, now, all of this happened because of popular struggles. It was because of labor movement and civil rights movement and so on. That led to freedom of the press to the extent that we've got it, and it's an important achievement. Uh, and, you know, it's by no means the end. Formal freedom of the press helps things, uh, but it doesn't end things. And there's no end. You know, there's always going to be new forms of authority and domination that you hadn't even noticed before that you're going to want to overcome and uh, eliminate. That's life, you know. As long as human life goes on, that's going to be the case. We can see the ones now that are oppressive and uh, uh, coercive, and we try to get rid of them. We get rid of them, we're going to find new ones that are being noticed. We get rid of them. You know. And it takes constant work. You know, over time, there's, after all, some slow progress. You know, it's not, I mean, if you, like, it's not very long ago that human slavery was considered completely legitimate, in fact, essential. Now it sounds outlandish. Well, that's progress. You know. And the progress came through struggle, not by anything else. Professor Chomsky, um, you've mentioned a couple of times um, a phrase called the discipline of media here in this country. Uh, and I was wondering, uh, one, if you could give us a couple of examples of that. Media um, discipline? Yes. Um, how it happens, Struc you know, structurally, I mean, who's doing it? How do they, how, how do, they do it? Um, two, why don't we ever see you on uh, talk shows like... Uh, Nightline in 60 Minutes, and 
If there's time, I'd also like you to comment on the significance of the U.S. opening negotiations with the PLO. If you could do that. Yeah, I just gave a long talk about that one last night. I, I think I'm going to beg off the third one because it's a big topic. I don't think it's very significant. My feeling is it's a delaying action to give Israel about a year or so to crush the uprising. That's exactly the way that Israel sees it. Uh, the Israeli Defense Ministry sees it that way, and I think it's exactly what happened. That's a big story in itself. I, if you're interested, I have a long, detailed analysis of this in the March issue of Z Magazine, which tells you what I think about it. Uh, on the first question, I guess I didn't quite understand it. I thought I was trying to give examples to show what the media does. As to the mechanisms, are you asking about the mechanism? Well, you know, uh, the mechanisms are basically two, as I see it, and it's the same in academic scholarship, incidentally. Uh, the, me the main mechanism is that people just internalize the values. You don't even make it into these systems unless you've already accepted their values. They weed you out along the way. That's a process that starts in kindergarten, where people are trained for obedience, and they're trained for conformity, and it goes all the way through, and the people who aren't obedient end up being discipline problems or taxi drivers or something or other. And the ones who make it through are, by and large, disciplined. They've already internalized the values, otherwise they can't make it. Now, there are people who escape, and that's why you get noise in the system, and it's very valuable. Uh, the other thing that happens, some of the people who escape uh, understand what's going on and do what they can. And if they pursue the kind of story that's unacceptable to the editors, and the editors are just part of the privileged class that shares power in other institutions, they hear about it. You know, their editor will come back and say, you know, you're, you're irresponsible or you're looking at the wrong story. Why don't you take a month off and work on the Metro beat? You know, uh, go to the police court or something. I'll clear up your mind. And, uh, uh, you know, there's all kinds of ways of getting people back on the right course. Uh, uh, or, you know, the government will come after them with, uh, you know, I was hearing some stories today from some journalists about how the Office of the Public Diplomacy leaked uh, lies about journalists who were reporting stuff that they didn't want to hear. And that's hard to live with, you know, pretty hard to live with in a competitive, difficult world like journalism. So there are all kind of mechanisms by which it happens. And people just learn, you know, either you get out or you somehow learn to live with it and you can do things within it. And there are people who do it very successfully. Uh, as to things like, say, Nightline and so on, let, let me just tell you a story. Uh, the other day, a couple of weeks ago, I was in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, maybe somebody here was there. Uh, and I was interviewed by a talk show, you know, community-supported, listener-supported radio station. It's a good station. And the, uh, the guy, the news editor, uh, you know, I've been on it a lot, but when I'm there or by phone or something, so I was on there for a while. And he started off the interview. He said he wa he's, this is a very enterprising guy. He interviews a lot of mainstream media people. Uh, and he had just interviewed a couple of weeks ago somebody from Nightline. I, I think his name is Jeff Greenfield, if that's the right name. Somebody who's like a producer or something from Nightline. And he, had, he played on the radio, again, the tape of that interview, which he had already played on the radio. And he played it for me, and he wanted me to comment on it. And he asked Greenfield, if that's his name, uh, why, just your question, why am I never on, I, never on Nightline? And uh, uh, Greenfield started off by, you know, kind of foaming at the mouth for a while about how this guy is wacko, he said. He's from Neptune, you know. Um, We've got to keep some standards, you know. And after the tantrum subsided, he made a comment which was, in fact, quite to the point. He said, it went roughly like this. He said, look, there may be some guy in Turkey who knows all about, uh, you know, I don't know what, the INF Treaty or something, but only talks Turkish. And that's just no use to us. We've got somebody, got to have somebody who can talk English. Now, he says, what we need is concision. What we need is somebody who can meet this requirement of concision. And then he said, you've got to say what you have to say in a few short sentences you know, without wasting time and so on. And as you've heard this evening, I'm not very good at that. He was <laughs> right about that. Uh, and Greenfield was pointing to something about the American media which is quite significant and is different from the media in any other country I know of, uh, Western Europe or Canada or anything else. The American media, to my knowledge, uniquely require that you have concision. That is, that every, if you ever do get on the media, say Nightline or anything else, you get a, like a couple of sentences in between two commercials or something like that. Or you get on the op-ed page, you get 600 words or something. And that's very important. Uh, that means that, see, it, th through that filter, only certain things can pass. 
You can always say conventional things. Like suppose I'm on Nightline and they say, what, did, what, do you want, what do you think we ought to do about terrorism? And I say, well, you know, Gaddafi is a mad dog. We ought to blockade Libya or something or other. I can say that under the condition of concision. Suppose, however, my answer is, well, George Shultz is one of the major terrorists in the world, and there are things we can do about that. We should do this, that, and the other thing. Uh, well, under the condition of concision, uh, I'm saying something which sounds outlandish. I mean, when people hear that, they have a right to ask what you mean. I never heard that before. I mean, I know Gaddafi's a terrorist. I hear it every day. Uh, but what do you mean when you say George Shultz is a terrorist? Well, to answer that question, you can't do it under the condition of concision. You have to give some arguments and some evidence, and that's not very hard, actually. Uh, but, you know, it'll take a few minutes, at least. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, once you give the argument the evidence, it's perfectly obvious, in fact. Uh, and, you know, whatever Gaddafi may be, he's just not in the same league, you know. And then we turn to other questions, like what we do about international terrorism. Okay, a different ballpark. But the point is, if you have the condition of concision, that just can't happen. Either you repeat some conventional thought, which doesn't require any evidence or argument, or else you say something which does sound like it's from Neptune, you know, or wacko. Because nobody heard, heard it before, and they want to know what's your reason, and you can't give your reason. Now, every other country I know about, you can give your reasons. Not only can you get on radio and television, but you can talk for a while. You can explain what you meant, you know. You get 15 minutes or something. Uh, and, and it's just assumed that way. Now, the American media are different, and I think I, I'm convinced some guys in the PR industry thought this up. Uh, because it's a terrific device. I mean, the media, like Nightline and the rest of them, they could let anybody on. In fact, in, in my view, if they were smarter, they'd let more dissidents on, because they'd all sound like they're from Neptune. You know? I mean, they would be saying these strange things and giving no reason for it, because there's no time to give reason, because you're cut off by the commercial or something. And uh, uh, like, here's some advice to anybody in the PR industry who may be around. I think you ought to tell those guys they're really losing a big opportunity. They ought to let dissidents on under their structural conditions. And they'll sound wacko, you know, and then you've won a point. Uh, but, you know, that, that's something really important, I think. And you know, so I'm not enthusiastic. I'm in a case, you know, like at Fair made a, uh, did a study of people on Nightline. Uh, and it was an interesting study, and it showed, you know, you can guess. Uh, a couple of days after that, I actually got an invitation to be on, no doubt, by accident. Uh, it, uh, and I, it happened I was going to be in Wyoming or something, couldn't do it, but, uh, you know, frankly, I wasn't all that eager. I mean, I don't think there's much you can say in three sentences, you know, that, that, that makes any sense. Maybe it's worth saying something just for your friends out there who can figure out what you're talking about, uh, but uh, they probably don't need it, you know. So I, I think there's a deeper problem, you know, I think there's a real deeper structural problem that the media. Yes, uh, Professor Tomsky, when I was reading your, uh, your book, Manufacture of Consent, it uh, was very eye-opening in terms of uh, uh, the, the argument you made around uh, the Vietnam War and that we were here was always a problem of tactics, but, but never one of the, the moral question about another country invading another one. What struck me is that uh, even though I thought that to myself, when reading the media, I did not feel that they had to think that. Um, so it, it never occurred to me to question on, them on that. And then the other thing that I thought of that was uh, closer to home was uh, a few weeks ago, uh, Ortega started, I guess, releasing the uh, National Guard and they were locked up. And it was pointed out in places like the Post, this would be a test of whether or not he's really um, serious about peace. The thing, the, the, the parallel that I had that people like yourself and other people I wrote about is the parallel that's pointed out about Hoover's COINTELPRO operation, where they admit that Hoover had illegal uh, operations against uh, groups that were not uh, 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 breaking the law. What's important about that is the fact that they never suggest that those people still remaining locked up, people like Geronimo Pratt, should be released. And I was wondering if you could speak to that. Yeah. Thank you. Actually, that second thing is interesting. And that's the kind of thing you read in the World Peace Council literature. See, when you read the Communist Party literature, they say that, and they're right. You know, uh, uh, I mean, they talk about human rights abuses in the United States. In fact, it should go beyond that. I and mean, it's not just a matter of releasing people who were illegally imprisoned, it's also a matter of prosecuting people who carried out crimes. Uh, COINTELPRO was a crime. It involved real criminal activities, like it involved things like Gestapo-style assassination. That's a crime. Uh, the murder of Fred Hampton, that was a major crime. And that's part of the COINTELPRO operation. And you ought to get after the people who are responsible for it, and there's a lot more like it. So there's plenty to do there. 
Uh, and I think people are pressed for that. That's important. Uh, as to the Vietnam thing, your reaction is extremely interesting because you know it's it's a very striking fact that most people react the way you do, thinking, look, it's not a matter of tactics; it's just morally wrong. In fact, that shows up in the polls. Very striking. As late as after all the propaganda, you know, the tons of propaganda, and nobody saying anything else to the public, as late as the 1980s about 70 percent of the population on the Gallup polls when asked what was the Vietnam War about say it was, they, here's the wording, fundamentally wrong and immoral, not a mistake. That's last I saw about 72 percent of the population. Now nobody ever says that, you know. Find somebody who says it was anything worse than a mistake. I, you won't find them. But that's what everybody thinks, alone, you know. Everybody sitting alone in front of a tube thinks what you thought. And the genius of American democracy is to make sure that everybody's sitting there alone in front of the tube, thinking, I must be off the wall because I'm the only person who thinks this. In fact, everybody thinks it, uh, or an awful lot think it, even without anybody saying it. And suddenly those same polls show that among a, what they call opinion leaders, now that's a mixed group, like it includes clergy and businessmen and others, very non-homogeneous group. But among opinion leaders, the number of people who think that is about 40%, not 70%. Uh, and among elite intellectuals, it's virtually zero. We know that from other sources. In fact, it was virtually zero right at the peak of anti-war protests around 1970. We know that from good evidence. Uh, but the, you know, these stupid and ignorant masses are somehow capable of seeing that when you carry out aggression, it's aggression. You have to be really smart to see that aggression is defense. That takes intelligence and training. Uh, so you've got to work on that one. Uh, but the genius of American democracy, I think, has, got, has been to atomize people. So whatever you think when you're sitting in front of a boob tube, you also think you're off the wall, you know, because you never hear it. And you don't have any contact with anybody else, because that's the, that's the brilliance of eliminating organizations. Like, you know, there's no labor unions, there's no political clubs, there's no, you know, about all there is is the churches. That's why all peace movement or any kind of activities go to the church. Like, when I'm invited to give a talk in the United States, it's either a college or a church. Uh, the reason is the churches are there, or the colleges are there. I, w I was in England a couple of weeks ago, and I gave two political talks. One of them was in a town hall in one of the downtown areas, and the other was in a guild hall, a union hall. Well, you know, that's never going to happen here in a million years. And that reflects something important. There's still the residue of popular democracy there. I mean, they're getting rid of it. They're a generation or so behind us, and 20 years from now, they'll be as advanced as we are. But they've still got these archaic things, like, you know, ways for people to get involved in politics and so on. Uh, and uh, the United States is advanced. We've eliminated most of that. But people are finding other ways to do it. Like I say, the system is very vulnerable, because people just organize in other ways, and very effectively, quite often. Yeah, thanks. I was wondering if you could say a few words about the conflict uh, that seems to be inherent in educating an elite such that they give the party line, but not such that they then question it and go beyond that. Yeah, that's very tricky business. You know? That's a good question. In fact, there's studies, there's interesting work on this. I mean, some of the work's on the educational system. There's a book by Sam Bowles and Herb Gintis about 20 years ago. Oh, the question is, how do you educate an elite in such a way that they give the party line, but don't go beyond it. It's, it's a contradiction, actually. I mean, you have to train people to be obedient, but you still need them to think. You know, that's very hard. That's one of the big problems that colleges have. Uh, and, uh, and it goes all the way down to the elementary schools. You know, for a large part of the population, you just train them to be obedient. Come on time, you know, get a C, watch, football, I mean, that's it. But for part of the population, they got to run the show, you know? And they've got to have some grasp of what's happening in the world, they have to be able to think through problems. Uh, at the same time, they got to have the right thoughts. That's a very tricky issue. And in fact, the elite schools and the general schools are quite different in this respect. Uh, when you get to the university levels, you really see things breaking up in all kinds of interesting ways. For example, in the natural sciences, you just can't be obedient. You can't lie, you know. You falsify your experiments and nature is out there telling you you're not going to get away with it. Uh, and maybe you can get away with it for a month or something, but not very long. 
Furthermore, you've got to be creative and disobedient. You can't have things like Marxism. You can't sit around for a century trying to figure out what the master said. You've got to figure out if he had anything to say and then go beyond it and show it was wrong and do something else. So you have to be creative and disobedient and you, know, you start in graduate work, you immediately start doing independent work and showing why your professor doesn't know what he's talking about and so on and so forth. That's what happens in the natural sciences. Now, of course, you want to make sure that those people don't think about the wrong topics. So you focus them like lasers, you know. They work on uh, problems of recursive function theory or, you know, uh, hadrons or something or other, and they don't think about anything else. So they can be creative over there. Uh, but the big problem arises in the fields that have something to do with the way the world works, you know, uh, training ideological managers or teachers or corporate managers or you know, political scientists and all that kind of stuff. And I think that's a real tricky problem. Uh, in fact, probably insoluble. You can't, there's a real contradiction in the educational system and it shows up, you know. You just can't have people repeat nonsense by rote and still expect them to be able to think when you call upon them to think to do your work for you. So it's a problem. And one that you, the people on the outs who are trying to change the system can play with, you know, can do a lot of things with. Um, this is related to what you said about structural limitations in our mass media, the, co the, the commercial news media, and the concision that's required in that structural limitation. I mean, Neil Postman talks about something, um, he says, is sort of the psychic revolution that's taken place in viewer listeners that not only allows us to, not only says that we don't get angry when there's an interruption in a report about hundreds of thousands of people dying in an earthquake, but we willingly accept it and and anticipate it, and the news is even sort of uh, built up in a dramatic fashion, so that uh, leading up to the commercial, you know, uh, there's, an, there's a peak and then there's a, a descension into the commercial. What do you think has caused that revolution in, in, in our minds that accepts this uh, structure? Well, for one thing, I'm not sure how much, I mean, I don't know, you know, I think it's very complicated. I mean, I think what he's saying is kind of interesting, but I'm not so sure people accept it. I have a feeling people tune out. I mean, the thing that strikes me in my own experience at least, is that if you can get people to listen, they get appalled, you know, hysterical. You know. If you can get people to listen to the, the stuff in the human rights reports, uh, their first reaction is, let's go down and burn up the State Department. You know. uh, and that's where the weatherman listen to the, the stuff in the human rights reports, uh, their first reaction is, let's go down and burn up the State Department. You know. Uh, and that's where the weatherman phenomenon comes from. There's a lot of nonsense written about that. But you watch what was happening, as I did, uh, and it's true that people went crazy, but they went crazy not without reason. You know, they were beginning to see things that they had never seen before, like they saw the assassination of Fred Hampton, and they saw what was happening in the slum. They didn't have to wait for COINTELPRO to come out to see. Last question. Yes, I'm glad the subject has been brought up at least a couple times here about the um, human rights violations in the United States. And uh, it seems to me, perhaps to you too, that the situation in the United States, uh, the attack against democracy and against human rights in the United States seems to be more serious now than it, than it has been in, perhaps in several decades. I wonder if you could comment uh, 
about the potentialities for the fascization of America, what you think is going on or how dangerous you think that the threat of some kind of fascism, even a covert fascism under the guise of democratic institutions, uh, what the prospects for that are in the U.S.? Well, uh, looks to me, I mean, you know, sort of low credibility judgment, so I don't think it too seriously, but my impression is that, I mean, one thing is pretty clear about the United States, it's a very depoliticized society. Uh, there aren't organizational structures, there's one political party. Look, we got through the last decade without a chief executive. That's an interesting fact. Uh, uh, it's a very interesting fact. It means that elections, you know, whatever people pretend whose job it is to pretend, everybody who has their head screwed on knows that Ronald Reagan was reading the lines written for him by the rich folk the same way he was doing in the 50s for GE, and that's all he understands. It doesn't make any difference whether he knew what the policy was or didn't know or whatever. And in fact, I think everybody understands that. That's why he disappeared as soon as the job was done and nobody cares anymore what happened to him. Uh, but, uh, and that's an important fact. I mean, that's part of the elimination of politics. You know, If you're voting for a completely symbolic figure, you have an election without issues, it's like voting for Queen or something like that. Somebody else is doing the work. Uh, and we've gone a long way towards that. The country is very depoliticized. When people don't organize politically, they get involved with people in other ways. So the United States has a huge fundamentalist movement. It's like Iran. In fact, there's some studies of, there's some studies of this that compare uh, you know, fanatic religious commitment to other things. And the thing it usually compares with is industrialization. So the more a society gets industrialized, the more things like, you know, belief in the devil and Latin witches and so on goes down. It's, it's a very good correlation. Uh, the only country that's way off the chart is the United States. That's interesting. It's kind of like, it's like Iran. It's like, it's actually like Bangladesh at the left time when this study was done about 10 years ago. Uh, and that's interesting. I think that relates to the fact that you don't have other ways of organizing. And it has a very effective, that's one side of it. Uh, it. There's other sides, like things like, say, the Central American Solidarity Movement or the general kind of movement activities in the United States. They really don't exist in Europe. Uh, and, and they're very effective in a lot of ways. I mean, all of this kind of decentralized, you know, spontaneous, uh, uncoordinated stuff has its defects, like things go out of existence and then you forget how to do it and you've got to start over and so on and so forth. But it's also kind of uncrushable, you know. You can't get at the head because there isn't any head. That's one of the reasons why the FBI always failed to indict people when they tried to crush the movements. They were always looking for the wrong people. And, you know, they couldn't figure it out. It's all too diffuse. You know. uh, so it's got its advantages and its disadvantages, and it's very substantial. And it's the kind of thing that you get in a depoliticized population. Well, to come to your question, what does all this mean? Well, you know, it seems to me it could mean one of two opposite things. Uh, it could be the base for major social change, positive social change, towards a much freer society, which really gets to attacking the main centers of power, which in fact are in the economic system, clearly. Uh, it, uh, or it could be a mass base for fashion. In fact, I think that same phenomenon could be either. That's been true in the past, and it could be true here. Which of those it come, turns out to be, I think, is not a matter for speculation. It's a matter for uh, pretty committed action. <laughs>